Welcome to the Millbury City Council meeting. Roll call, please. We're not on. All council members are present. Thank you. We apologize for the delay. We had a, a couple earlier meetings. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. No ceremonial presentations. Agenda overview. Mr. Williams, please. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening to you, Vice Mayor and members of the City Council. Tom Williams, City Manager. I uh, would like to briefly uh, give you an update on activities that are happening within the city. Tomorrow night, Wednesday, May 23rd, we'll be hosting the Design It Yourself Native Plant Landscape Workshop at the Millbrae Library. Participants will talk and learn the principles of garden design, see an example of a design from start to finish, and create a landscape design of their own. Uh, the workshop is free to attend, and we'll start at 7 p.m. again at the Millbrae Library. Uh, to RSVP is 650-349-3000 is the number. Again, that's area code 650-349-3000. And also, as, as you may have seen, uh, there was traffic enforcement um, last Friday uh, conducted by the Sheriff's Department, and that was on last Friday, May 18th. And uh, they stepped up their pedestrian safety enforcement and focused the enforcement to address the primary collision factors involving motorists and pedestrians uh, mostly at the intersection of El Camino Real and Millbrae Avenue. Uh, pedestrian fatalities are rising in California as more people are using non-motorized means of transportation, and the Sheriff's Office mapped out locations over the past two years where pedestrians involved uh, collisions where they have occurred along uh, with violations that led to those crashes. So the Sheriff's Office personnel conducted uh, saturation enforcement uh, to address these collision factors. They deployment They, they deployed the deployment resulted in 34 citations. So they issued 34 citations that day. Um, one was failing to stop at a red light, uh, one for unsafe passing, one for blocking a sidewalk, uh, one for an unsafe turn, and 30 were all failures to, lead, to yield to a pedestrian within a crosswalk. So good work by the Sheriff's Department. Uh, the Millbrae Community Center Design Concept Survey is underway. Uh, we thank everyone who has participated uh, to support the creation of the design concepts out in the community uh, for our new Millbrae Community Center. Over the past two weeks, dozens of people have weighed in with their opinions, but we need more people to share those opinions and ideas by taking the online survey that's available on the city's website. And then lastly, the Mills High School students shine with the award for the National Merit Scholarship. Last week, the Mercury News ran a story on California students who are being awarded with the National Merit Scholarship, and there were two Mills High School students, Catherine Chan and Hongzhu Zhao, uh, were among the awardees here locally. Uh, Very good. Every year, more than a million students compete for the scholarship, and it was awarded to students who possess outstanding academic record and have accomplished great things in and out of the classroom. So congratulations to those two students. Next, to uh, review the agenda, after uh, this presentation, there's public communication um, followed by the consent calendar. Item five of the consent calendar is a resolution awarding construction contract to Granite Construction uh, for the Old Bayshore Highway and Rollins Road repaving project in the amount of $1.3 million and approving a professional service agreement with Belechi and Associates in the amount of $118,000 and authorizing the city manager and my designee to execute the subject contracts and contract change orders up to the project contingency amount of $197,000. And this is an action item. Item number six is the Community Center Rebuild Project Information Update. That's an informational item. Item number seven is the resolution electing to become subject to the uniform public construction cost accounting procedures that are set forth in the Uniform Public Construction Cost Accounting Act, directing the city manager to notify the state controller uh, of this election. That's through a resolution uh, to be adopted. And then also waive the second reading uh, uh, of the ordinance 
and amend Chapter 2.20 of Title II of the Millbrae Municipal Code to update the purchasing system and provide bidding procedures under the Uniform Public Construction Cost Accounting Act. And again, waive the second reading and adopt the ordinance amending Chapter 2.20 of Title II of the Millbrae Municipal Code to update the purchasing system and provide bidding procedures under that act. So this is an action item, and there are uh, three actions. Waive, waive the second reading, adopt the ordinance, and also adopt the resolution. Item number eight is to approve a waiver of fees totaling $575 for the Millbrae Historical Society, their annual barbecue event for July 4th, 2018. There are no public hearings this evening, so moving to existing business under item number nine is to review and consider an ordinance regulating short-term residential rentals. Under new business, item number 10, resolution approving a new maximum garbage rate schedule, which will become effective July 1st of 2018 in full accordance with the franchise agreement with South San Francisco Scavenger Company, and that is an action item. And lastly, item number 11 is the first budget review of the two-year operating budget and capital budget for fiscal years 2018-19 and fiscal years 2019-20, and that is an action item, but this would just be the first uh, review of the budget, and uh, final budget adoption would be scheduled for June 12th. So with that, Mayor, that concludes the manager's report this evening and agenda review. Questions from the council? Yes, Ms. Schneider? I would like to pull agenda item um, seven. Your mic wasn't on. Could you repeat that? Would like to pull agenda item number seven from consent calendar for a brief comment. Okay. That being said... Um, it, Mr. Williams, and with the permission of the Sheriff's Department, there was a video of the um, operations of the Sheriff's Department. Um, can we get that up on our website as well? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the YouTube was very interesting, and thank you for not taking it out on all the drivers, but some pedestrians need to be more alert as well. So thank you. Um, we have one public communication win. Please. Nice to see you. Hi, my name is Wynn Gersich, and now that it's election time, this is a time we can get Jackie Spears out of office. If you all watch this video on YouTube, it says 2017 banded documentary tells the truth about water exposed. This will show you what floral silicic acid is, and she wrote a bill in 1995 to fluoridate the rest of the state. Menlo Park in East Palo Alto got the poison in their water in 2005. So I've been going down there, and my boyfriend's going to Menlo Park hopefully tonight to tell the people not to vote for Jackie Spears. But I've asked the city councils to have a town hall meeting, show this video, and have Jackie Spears explain why she poisoned her, the drinking water for the rest of California. Uh, in 2000. 14, I went up to um, Sonoma, and I met Paul Connett from Fluoride Action Network, which I have put the Harvard brain damage studies on fluoridation on public record in this city and many cities, even the school boards. And um, everybody seems to go, blah, 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 blah. this is real. This stuff will kill you, and it also lowers your children's IQs. And it's got lead in it and arsenic and cyanide. So arsenic, low doses of arsenic, causes cancer. And this is very important because this is your life, and it will sterilize you too. So if it doubles breast cancer death rates, I think Jackie Spears should, um, in my opinion, she belongs in jail. And when you watch this video, believe me, you will be angry and she should not be reelected, and I hope that you tell people. But most of all, this is the one that's the killer. This right here is a 5G compilation. This has the guy from the California Tumor Registry talking about um, He's talking about the 5G frequencies that they're putting in and these small cell towers all over. And this is probably the most important thing that you can see. This video right here will scare the heck out of you because this is murder. And he's going to talk about having over 300 scientists trying to stop this globally. Uh, Barry Trower is the man who uh, was the microwave specialist. And his, his video is Dr. Barry Trower, 5Gs will devastate humanity, but those behind it are above the law. 
He is trying to go globally to get other countries. He's got 40 nations trying not to put these 5G frequencies in because they don't have to bomb you anymore. All they have to do is blast the frequencies. They can give you cancer. It's mind control. They can cause screaming in your head. They can do all kinds of stuff. They can actually make you hear like you're, like you're um, you know, like people that are schizophrenic and they hear voices. They can do that to you. <laughs> This is scary. So any metal that you have on your body, if you've got wire rim glasses and underwire bra, if you sleep on a bed that's got springs in it, and they have this near your house, they have this eight houses down from where I live. They put it right near the schools because it cooks the girls' ovaries and it sterilizes people. But this is the other one too. 5G frequencies, 5G kill frequencies required in all cities and more bad news. This is from uh, Deborah Tavares. If you look up stopthecrime.net, 5G kill frequencies required in all cities. This is part of the depopulation plan. And everybody needs to be aware of this. Because if you're not, you better get on board. Because this is something you should be protesting at the city councils and telling all your neighbors. But most of all, this was in the news today. Uh, Libby Shaft is going to have a um, bill that they're trying to push through that anybody who warns illegal immigrants about ICE coming will spend five years in jail. So this is the title of the article. This was in the uh, Daily Review. Bill focuses on shaft raid warnings. Please check it out. Okay. um, Moving approval of the minutes. Sorry, I skipped ahead there. Okay. Your comments, please. Um, On the minutes of February 13th, under public comment, there are three members of the public who commented, and their comments are fairly neutral. They don't really say what those people said. So I can't vote for those minutes as they stand, but I'm sure I'll be the one out of four. As to the minutes of May 8th on page... Did you, um, I'm sorry, uh, I don't quite understand. Uh... There were three people speaking about the vice mayor rotation. The comments in the minutes are fairly whitewashed. They basically said that these people spoke about the vice mayor rotation. They didn't say what they said. To me, what that means is anybody in the future going back to look at past agenda, uh, past minutes will actually have to go to the videotape to see what the public actually said. So I understand the desire to have minimus minutes, but not to the point where they so mis- simplify the information or what people have said that it doesn't really reflect what was really said. And in that case, and I don't know about any other minutes that had to do with that particular item, I don't know if those also have been so simplified as to be meaningless. Okay, Okay, and on May 8th, um, on page 10, where it says, I reported that there was a dead body next door, it was actually left there for weeks. It was several weeks that the dead body was left at a house operating as an Airbnb, so I'd like that corrected. Page 10, um, number, page 4, number 10. So just to correct that minute on there. Thank you. Mr. Lee? Um, on May 8th, under agenda overview, where it says Vice Mayor Wayne Lee announced to item 10. Could you change that to request, announced to request? Thank you. And then, uh, With the changes to, um, why don't we take these separately? February 13th, I've made a motion to approve the minutes. Um, Ms. Oliva has seconded. Uh, The minutes for February 13th passed with a vote of four to one with council member Schneider opposing. Oh, I'm sorry. The minutes for February 13 passed with a vote of four to one with Council Member Schneider opposing. Okay, minutes um, of May 8th with the addition of Ms. Schneider's. Mine's on. With the addition of Ms. Schneider's comment, um, do we have a motion? We do have a motion. Your votes, please. The minutes for May 8th pass unanimously. Thank you. And we have the consent item. Item 7 has been pulled. We have items 5, 6, and 8. Vice Mayor Lee has made the motion. Seconded by Mr. Holliver. Your votes, please.
So which item was pulled? Item seven. Item. So the items five, six, and eight on the consent calendar pass unanimously. Okay, can we, a briefing on seven? Item seven, did you have a specific comment? I do. Um, when we talked about the construction contract format, we talked about American-based manufacturing for products that would be used for those projects, and it's not in the minutes from that council meeting, it says that federal projects require the use of American-made products. I'd like to see that in that all of our bid documents include a preference for American-made products as well as, and I won't use the correct terminology, uh, Mr. Williams, if you can help me with that, women and minority-owned business, local business preferences that apparently can be built into RFPs for local contract work so that we try to keep jobs locally. So it wasn't. It couldn't go in the minutes, and we'd just like to see this come back to us as a future. If, if we're going through all of our purchasing agreements and all of our RFP agreements, that we consider local-based and American-based products. Thank you. So that said, why don't we have some standard language proposed for future contracts? As well, if, if there's any disadvantage. Um, DBE. I, I would just do. note the. Jurisdictions that have those programs have a significant ordinance with an entire program. So I think it's a maybe a council goal issue in terms of is that something you want to pursue. I would also note that um, American Steel requirements are uh, incredibly complicated. Uh, we spend a lot of time assisting clients in how to address those. So I think that's something worth careful consideration. It's not it's not an easy thing to accomplish. Well, and I think the suggested recommendation was for a preference. Yeah. So I don't find any problems with preferences related to American made. Um, if it gets into further detail, which we might want to look at in the future. Yes. Ms. Attorney, Oliva? When we use the word preference, um, do we hold ourselves liable for anything? Well, I think any anytime you add another element to a bidding context you raise the you raise the issue of it if it resulting in uh, a, a challenge or a protest um, again there, there are uh, quite well developed uh, procedures for how to give bid preferences uh, veterans get bid preferences some um, some are well crafted others others are not uh, in, in in the transit field there's a 10 point preference for people who retain the employees of the prior contractor where are those 10 points where the legislature thought those 10 points were going to go into a calculation of how to it's 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 completely on un, salt so um, I think we can look at that and maybe get back and give you some advice in terms of how such a preference could be employed and whether other cities do it I, I'm just saying it's it's not so easy and and it, it may be more effort than you want to undertake I'd like to make a motion to Miss Oliva has made the motion Mr. Holliber seconds your votes, please. Item seven on the consent calendar passed unanimously. No public hearings. Moving on to existing business. We have item nine, review and consideration of an ordinance regulating short-term residential rentals. We do have some speaker slips on that. I think we would be... Um, best suited by a briefing on this before we begin. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to introduce Mr. Tom Maddalena, who is our Deputy Director in the Planning Department, to provide a presentation this evening. Do you want to pass it out? Thank you, Chair Papin and Member of the Council. I'm here tonight to present on the um, our draft short-term residential rental ordinance for the City of Mowbray. Um, tonight, as Tom mentioned, we'd like to bring this before you as a result actually of uh, direction that was given to, to staff as a result of the May 8th Council meeting in which we heard from stakeholders that included law enforcement, um, Airbnb, and members of our community and renters of these uh, short-term rentals. And so as a result, um, the, the City Attorney's Office uh, helped us and they crafted a um, draft ordinance for us that was put before you with the staff report. And so... Talk about overall the need and sort of the purpose of the, the short-term residential um, rental ordinance itself. Um, currently, there, these residential residential rentals 
short-term residential rentals are banned within the city of Millbrae in the R1 and R2 districts. And we, have, we, we believe, according to Airbnb, that we have approximately up to 200 plus of these operating illegally within the city currently. Um, and so therefore we need... Is that just Airbnb or is that other companies? My understanding is that it was just an estimate from Airbnb from one online hosting platform. And so therefore, uh, we, it's determined that we really need to address the advent of these short-term residential rentals within the city of Millbrae. Um, and given the lack of available information that we have on these units and the, appropriate pol or and the lack of appropriate policy in place, um, enforcement has hereby been hampered, hampered and could benefit from policy that's designed to best address this emerging shift in land use. And the ordinance itself was addressed or designed to address the community concerns which can provide for improved mechanisms for both law enforcement and the city millibrate, which are needed while allowing the use to exist and operate properly within the city. And so the goals of the ordinance itself, um, it, it's kind of a complex issue in the sense of we're trying to craft an ordinance that regulates a use that doesn't maybe fit well within the areas in which it's um, existing or would, would maybe be allowed to exist. And so therefore we're trying to address a complex issue that's created by these emerging markets in the context of fit within our local land use policy as well as enforcement. Um, and so therefore we propose to institute a permitting process within the planning division of community development that would allow for the city to obtain essentially the necessary information on these short-term rentals as well as their operators. Um, this would establish also operating rules for the short-term residential rentals that will preserve or will help to preserve um, the residential character of neighborhoods. Uh, the, the, later on we'll talk about um, hosted or non-hosted and caps that are placed upon what are called non-hosted units, um, which in theory would help to preserve housing stock both on the long-term rental uh, basis as well as to preserve the potential for people to have home ownership uh, because these are short-term residential rentals are classified as 30 days or less. Um, and then also we wanted to establish operating rules for short-term residential rentals. Oops, sorry, I said that already. Um, it will also create an avenue to collect tra transient occupancy tax revenue streams on the same level as traditional sources, um, so, such that we receive from hotels or motels or other commercial lodging uh, located within the city. And we believe that it will provide additional tools to our peace officers and code enforcement officers in case of disturbances. And it also should help mitigate the impacts on housing stock for homeowners and long-term renters. That was the preserving, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, these short-term residential rentals uh, would be allowed as an accessory use in our residential districts. Uh, however, these units, just to confirm though, these units will be required uh, to be in compliance with all the rules and regulations. And so should we go out there um, and, and do an inspection or see that something else isn't up to code, I think that would be a time that which we would address that appropriately. Um, only single-family homes, units in duplexes, triplexes, or multifamily dwellings um, and accessory dwelling millions may be rented either whole or in part. Um, and there's no rental of non-residential structures. So even though it's allowed in our commercial district, it must be a residential, uh, for, it must be for residential habitation. And the short-term residential rental units must be the primary residence of the, least, the lessors, and the number of the nights is capped for the non-hosted at 100, and that's also designed such that uh, the, the theory behind that is is that and, uh, um, it doesn't provide for, uh, the, let's say, the benefit of somebody wanting to invest in the city of Millbrae, purchase a home, and then only utilize on a short-term residential rental basis. So it tries to preclude that. About the, a little bit about the permitting process that we hope to, uh, to uh, implement. Um, permits will be required. Um, it will be called the short-term residential rental permit. Uh, we also would require a business license. And it would also require a transient occupancy tax registration certificate so we can work on the, uh, the receipt of those TOTs. And then also the applicants for non-hosted rentals uh, must provide two authorized agents who have the authority to manage the property. Um, the goal behind this is to assist law enforcement in case of where we have a nuisance or a disturbance that occurs, uh, that there's more than one person that can be on site, I believe within one hour is the way it's crafted such that uh, we can deal with that appropriately during the evening hours. And the short-term residential rental permit has, can be revoked um, and where, where the use is detrimental to either public health, safety, or the welfare of our, our community for repeated violations of the operational rules or failure to pay uh, the taxes on the, on the unit. We want to uh, create also a short-term residential rental registry. Uh, we would create that to maintain a citywide registry of all the short-term residential rentals, their current authorized representatives, and contact information, again, for law enforcement 
as well as our code enforcement. It would also, though, be available to the public. And with that, um, as far as the noticing mechanism, what we, what we propose is that upon approval of the business license and the permit, um, then our community development department would be required to, to send out a mailer or a notification to pro all property owners within 500 feet of that residential unit, um, essentially notifying them of the permit that this is now going to exist, contact it, it would give them a lot of the pertinent information, that, um, who to contact with at, for law enforcement in case of a disturbance, information of that nature. to talk about some of the operational rules for the units. Um, it, it, it distinguishes between hosted, somebody that's there on site living there in their own premise or renting out, um, versus a non-hosted unit, which does, would not have that uh, situation. Uh, the nighttime occupancy hours would be limited to two persons per bedroom plus two people, and then the daytime occupancy would be twice that. And uh, parking is a challenge. Uh, the way that we propose parking with this policy is that no additional parking would be required. However, the number, the number of vehicles for either the renters or their guests would be required to be accommodated on site. So they have to have existing on site parking in order to accommodate the number of vehicles that would come to utilize the unit. Uh, and those existing on site must be made available to their guests or their renters. That makes sense. I can come back to that with questions if necessary. Um, and so we also, with, the, with this, um, this is only in relation to a residential short-term rental that weddings, corporate events, commercial functions, um, or any other similar type of event which has the potential really to cause either traffic, parking, or some other noise or nuisance uh, would basically would not be allowed. It's prohibited from occurring as part of a short-term residential rental. Um, one of the benefits is, is that uh, there would be the potential for the city to, to receive, um, it would provide an avenue for us to receive transient occupancy tax, and it would allow us to collect that TOT for this, um, for this use that is currently existing and is operating within our city and impacting the city, quite frankly. Um, the revenue that we sort of ballpark estimate this, um, you know, there's a number of different numbers that we have seen or used, let's say, as far as like a rack rate or the, or the rate for a room per night, which is how we came up with this estimation. Um, but revenues would be estimated to have the potential to provide upwards of $600,000 annually for the city. And we would have these increased reporting requirements for hotel operators, including short-term short -term rental operators. And these, uh, we uh, believe that these additional revenues, these revenues generated, could provide us the opportunity to hire additional code enforcement officer staff that could improve on the overall health and safety of the community itself. And then now to the code enforcement and policing side, um, we, we believe that with this will give the tools and mechanisms to provide the potential to better regulate with additional staff resources. That's through the money that would be provided from the TOT. Um, the ordinance will provide the policy for code enforcement and those additional tools for law enforcement when a, a disturbances or some other um, uh, issue is brought to our attention. It allows us for a better understanding of where these are located within the city. So right now, we, you know, we can hear about a call or understand that we, you, you may know where they are, you may not. Uh, we have a better idea uh, with an actual list uh, of where they're located so that we can uh, react more quickly, uh, we'll put, which also put our law enforcement in a better position. Uh, the authorized agents would be required to respond within 60 minutes, I believe, on the property. And they would also be required to allow officers access into the unit when the officer suspects that there's some type of uh, illegal or illicit activity going on. And the last part is that the, the lessors would be strict, uh, strictly liable for violations of the operating restrictions by their guests. And there are penalties. There's fairly uh, reasonable, reasonably strict penalties that are imposed, I believe, at $1,000 per day. Um, for an ongoing infraction. And with that being said, the comments and questions are welcome. Thank you. Mayor, may, may I? I'd, li I'd like to introduce uh, Jarrett Yen. He's an attorney with Hanson Bridget. He's done the lion's share of the preparation of the ordinance and also the other attachments um, that are part of the staff report in the ordinance, the waivers, the short-term rental application draft. So Jarrett is here to uh, answer specific questions uh, regarding the ordinance and, and legal aspects and enforcing aspects as well. So welcome, Jared. Thank you, Drew. Do you have anything to add at this point? No, um, but I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, um, I think some clarifying questions would be helpful here. Um, I am assuming that city staff is not capable of either tracking or enforcing this at this point in time. 
There was some mention of a um, contracting with a company. Uh, we thank Airbnb for working with us here, but there are a lot of other companies out there that also need to be held to a standard. Should we come to an agreement tonight? I don't know. But um, what information do we have on tracking, enforcement, and all of that should we go down this path? Well, I think that that's something that we would we would sort of develop and learn as time goes on. Currently, we don't we don't have those mechanisms in place within the city, as you know. Um, I think you first kind of alluded to, to staffing, um, and you know we do have a bit of a concern with that, given that we know that with one there's potentially 200 with one hosting platform. We're talking about requiring permitting of, of all of these type of units, um, and so we've tried to cautiously approach our. our um, the development of the policy to at least currently take that into consideration. Um, and then your other part of your question was, I might have missed you. Well, enforcement and tracking of these various companies is exceptionally important. We could have an ordinance that means absolutely nothing if we're not able to enforce it or track these businesses. So this is a concern of mine. Um, but looks like Tom, you're if, if, I, if I may. Um, so uh, Deanna Hillebrandt, who is our uh, Deputy City Manager and Finance Director has been reaching out to several firms and doing some due diligence on that. So we are gathering some information. Uh, Muni Financial is one firm, and there are, are, are two other companies um, that are on our radar that we are reaching out to and meeting with. So in terms of, of tracking database, which is different than our code enforcement um, aspects of it, we are working also collection management of the TOT revenue and auditing. So we are, we are um, doing our due diligence on those firms. Well, I mean, we want to be serious about this. Public safety is first and foremost, and you've included that in here. But again, it means nothing unless we can take action um, regarding the whole picture, I would, regarding all the companies and everything that's out there. So how long would it take to actually impl put this all into implement an ordinance and make it worth something as far as ensuring our public safety? So, so the process is we'll need to, you know, after tonight, if we get your direction, uh, we'll work with legal counsel, make the change of the ordinance. We do then have to go to the planning commission, have a planning commission hearing, and then to the city council. So during that time, concurrently, uh, during that period, we will bring to you a um, management plan, enforcement plan, along with, with the ordinance. To build on what Tom was, was adding there is that tonight we're really looking for direction. So we're sort of we're bring, bringing this forward as a process prior to going to the Planning Commission, which would be our normal route, um, looking for more direction from Council prior to sort of refining it, getting it to Planning Commission before it comes back to you. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of direction. Um, and I thank you. This is a huge step in the right direction. Sure. So thank you very much for that, Vice Mayor Lee. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, can we, uh, um, the Mayor had a really good um, comment and is there is there a way that we can require that any uh platform that provides opportunities for short-term rentals to register or be permitted in the city so we know who's here permanent uh, so airbnb would have a business license yeah mm -hmm. have that's right so i think that there are a couple of components to this i, I think that it I, i've chatted with a couple of I've, some city attorneys from around the state who have um, also been dealing with uh, these kinds of issues. I think that typically um, the, the online platforms are fairly willing to sign voluntary collection agreements by which they would help the city to collect transient occupancy tax when, they're, when somebody's paying for their room on Airbnb, Airbnb would, would add a $5 fee or whatever the tax is um, and, and then um, forward that to the city. Um, the, the companies are typically much less willing to do things like share information on, on where that money is coming from, which units are being rented, how frequently units are being rented, um, whether the units are rented or, or, or share information about whether the units are rented have city permits. Um, this is, this is a, uh, I guess, a point of contention right now between cities across the country, really, but especially in California and companies like Airbnb, and, and it's the subject of some ongoing litigation. Um, I think I believe uh, the city of Santa Monica currently has a case before the Ninth Circuit um, uh, challenging, or I, guess, I suppose Airbnb has a, a case in front of the Ninth Circuit challenging 
on the city of Santa Monica's ability to require them to provide information and to cooperate with the enforcement actions. Um, and, and so we should have more guidance on our ability to uh, compel information and request information within the next year or so. Um, but this is very much a, a dynamic field where the law is, is still in flux. Okay, so the, my question is, can we require online these type of platforms to get a business license or register with the city? Because they are doing business in, in the city. Um, I, I believe that they I'm are- I'm not talking about the host, I'm talking about the platform. Uh, Airbnb or V, uh, was it VBOR? Yeah. Um, I, I believe that there are some cities that have required them to um, to get TOT certificates and things like that. Um, getting more information from them um, than just a, a business license is more difficult. Okay. Well, I think that's a good step. So we know what we're, we're dealing with. Um, I know there are companies who who some cities hire to track. You know who's renting, who's who's not right. So, um, the the other thing is, um, I like to see if we could. Um, okay, I lost. Anyway, so I, I'm moving on to the other part, which is we haven't really a, a addressed is the. You know, the host can do only so much, but if somebody wants to come in the city and cause trouble, you know, they can obviously they can get by. They can get through to the, the, the uh, whatever system that's meant to to screen them, and this is what probably happened in this Airbnb issue. Um, so I like to see that there's some sort of incentive for people who rent that will you know have a little bit more respect for property and their neighbor and the neighboring uh, properties. Um, so maybe that uh, two two things: one that that these um, online short-term rental platforms require that the before they can sign on as a host that they show that they have a they've already applied for a permit with the city i, I don't think that's I th you know so we require it anyway we require them to get a permit right right the I host so that before they can even be a host on their platform they need to demonstrate that they, they've gotten a permit timing i guess is the question so I, I believe that the ordinance does do that in the sense that the in, in order to host uh, a short term or to be a host for on a short term uh, or to rent your, your unit out as a short term rental, you need to get a short term rental permit. From but that's that's incumbent on the host, not on the platform. So we want that platform to, before they're allowed somebody on their platform that they that the, the person who's using their platform shows that they have obtained a permit before. They're allowed the, to use the platform. The renter would obtain a permit. Yes, not the renter. The, He's the host. That the host. I'm. I'm not sure that you can do that timing-wise because the residents would have to approach the host company. I mean, you're kind of asking for the reverse. You're asking almost the hosts to go out and solicit the residents. No, 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 no. That's not what I meant. Well, um, if I'm a host, or not a host. I'm sorry. If I'm the operator on the internet. I don't know anything about Millbury till somebody comes to me and wants to work through my service. So they would already have to have had the licenses and stuff. It's almost in reverse. Well, that then you want to verify because when you sign on to any of these things anyway, you have to do certain things to show. You have to show credit card. You have to show, you know, you have to show, provide information, right? So why can't we say you also have to provide this information, which is that you've registered and you got a permit with the city? Well, I think that's what Airbnb had suggested to us. If we work through an ordinance and we have an established ordinance, then anyone who wishes to be a host within the city of Millbrae, it would pop up automatically. In order for you to rent here, you would need the three things and you would also be paying the TOT. Well, I, I want it codified, that's what I'm saying. Well, I think that's what we're trying to do with the ordinance. I didn't see that. Um, okay, you want to go ahead? No, 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 I got one more thing. The, the other thing, too, I, I like to see that um, if somebody's renting their place without a host or not somebody, the host not on, on site, that, they, that the online platforms require some sort of substantial deposit. $2,500 or $5,000, you know, that they need to, um, that we require that they put that deposit down. 
I think Tom has a response that, yeah. for I, I that. If Go I'm ahead. understanding you correctly, we do require a deposit of a thousand dollars, I believe, for the city to recoup costs. But maybe we have to take a look for speaking That's of our costs. That is. Though. That's yeah. for the city. I'd like to see that for, you know, just for, a, large, for, a larger amount. That for the ho for the homeowner for the. Uh, no, no, the, the renter, the renter, the person is. The renter renting. provides to the the the, 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 uh, the homeowner. Ms. Mr. Uh -huh, Lee, yeah. I, I do believe that depending on the operator that you're working through, in other words, Airbnb has an enormous insurance and policy. Now, should someone work through another operator which does not have an insurance policy, that would be. But that's after the fact. What this this what this purpose of this of this deposit would be is to to to, to incentivize people from not causing property damage. So if I knew I was going to lose my deposit, just like you're renting, someone rents from me, I require they give me, you know, first and last rent and whatever, that's a deposit. So if, if they mess up my place, then I can use that deposit and take that deposit from them. And I think we can use the same in the same way that if somebody, somebody wants to rent a unit, that they need to put a, a, a significant deposit so then to, to um, to deter them from damaging that property. Legal counsel. I just one global comment. I think the more we try to specify to the platforms exactly how they do their business, the more likely we're going to get pushback. So uh, I, I think the ideas are great. I think we would need to look at them carefully um, because as we've seen, they've litigated things that I think seem fairly reasonable to us. Um, I, I would note that that Airbnb does have a substantial fund to pay the homeowner, the host, if there is damage. But I know that's not exactly what you're. No, because thinking. that's after the fact. Right. Yeah. Okay. You go and damage, and you you shoot up the neighborhood, and we'll give you you know no problem. We'll give you a thousand dollars to fix the house. You know, ten thousand dollars. That's that's after the fact. Would you want to pay thousands of dollars to? Well, I had to put a deposit down when I'm renting a place. <laughs> but for one night. That's yeah. For one night. For a hotel I'm not room, sure would you that's pay thousands of dollars in a deposit? Well, they have security at, at hotels. That's true. <laughs> Again, that's, I think, included in the part of the rental. Mr. Holliber and then Ms. Schneider? And, you, uh, I'm sorry. Did you have something? I, I did. Um, I have a question about what, uh, do, and I, I don't think I saw anything in here about um, what would result in a denial of a permit application. Um, you know, I, I see there are a number of items that the uh, host would have to agree with, but it almost sort of assumes that if you apply for a permit, you're going to get it. Um, can you speak to that? I think we envision, uh, let's say if they were up to code, if there were issues with their property as far as not being up with their current uh, enforcement as far as our, our code our code is concerned. Um, and the other, I'd have to th think more clearly, Tom, do you have any other examples right now what we're considering on that? Well, yeah, I think a couple of things that, you know, anybody that would sign up for the program, we would have a, a building inspection, we'd have fire inspection, um, we would look at, you know, do they have anything that has been constructed without a building permit, um, and, and we would not issue a permit until those issues were brought up to code and resolved. And then also if somebody um, has a two-bedroom unit but they're requesting occupancy of 10, obviously that would be denial. Planning would look at the issue of parking. And, and use their discretion to see if the amount of occupants that the permit would be approved for versus the parking surrounding neighborhood. Um, we do have a noticing requirement of 500 feet of, from the property line of all adjacent, or not even adjacent, within 500 feet. Um, so it's, it would be an administrative permit, almost like a planning director hearing um, type process. So there are, there are certain things that, that we would find that could deny the permit. Um, but so, actually, I've just thought about that. So if it is denial, is there, a, is there an appeal process? Yes, there is. So under our existing code. So, um, so there's also, this is uh, section 7.30.050, the second paragraph outlines the, um, the criteria for granting an application. Um, it also notes in, in the third paragraph that the director has some discretion to impose conditions um, if, the, if for whatever reason a particular property looks like it might need um, a, a, are there are special considerations for particular properties? Um, and, and we can also revoke permits um, if they're detrimental to the welfare of the community or impose extra conditions. 
Okay. Um, and then one other just brief comment on the occupancy uh, limitations. First of all, I'm, I'm glad that that's in there. Um, I think we should also consider studio units um, or, you know, an in-law, something like that. May not necessarily have a legal bedroom, um, but I don't think that would be... I would imagine a studio would be treated like a one-bedroom. Is that correct? That's how I would approach it, yes. So maybe we should just, just include that. Let's clarify that, correct. Ms. Schneider is next. I'm um, just going to leave it with the head. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Go right ahead, please. As always, I'm going to have a lot, so go ahead. Well, I have a couple nitpicking. If I can look at the Oh, go ahead, bit. nitpick away. I wanted to uh, know the two, that number 200, is that per year? Is that per the year? 200. Um, given that I was, on, my understood it was an estimate, yeah, I don't know the, ex I would say as a stamp in time probably is probably the way I would believe that that was told to us is that currently existing is 200 versus let's say over the time of a year where they come and go. It, Without, if I may, yeah. a little more clarification. As we understand it, so 200 units are registered with Airbnb, um, of which an average of 100 nights per unit um, is what the estimate is. So that would be 20,000 room nights annually. Okay. Um, I went on the, the I, that's hard to believe, just because I went on the app. I'm sure everybody else up here did too, and there's not that many that are available. Um, the, I have a, a, a question with regards to the on-site parking spaces. And um, how are we going to be able to regulate a city street if there's more cars on it. I mean, how does this help off sites? It's just, I mean, this is where I'm going with the that's mayor's a, a comment that, on we can write all this stuff down, but how are we going to enforce it? So those, that, those are that, great questions. That, that part really is bothersome. Um, and then I probably have a, um, a question for the, your, Jared, the, our attorney here. Um, what, how do you define, um, how do you define, hold on one second. Primary resident. What, do, what does primary resident mean in this case? So there's a definition in, in the ordinance, um, and that is, I don't want to misquote it. Um, yes. Do I have? I might have printed an old copy. No, but yeah, it's um, page four. Yeah, so it's... It's a, a dwelling unit where the person is domiciled, which is a legal term. Um, it basically means your permanent residence where you intend to return, um, and where, where they reside for at least 265 nights per year. So when you read the short-term rentals is primary residence, this could be a tenant? Yes. Okay, so the, the tenants, the tenants could we're, we're imposing additional additional rules to tenants that already signed a lease that this is already enforced. If they have an, a California lease, you can't have a guest for over 10 days. So, if, so first, the tenant, in order to obtain a short-term rental uh, permit, would need the permission of the owner of the property. Um, and we've prepared a form, I believe it's in the application. Um, so I think that should be clarified a little bit there for primary residents to make sure that, you know, that the, the tenancy agreement with their landlord supersedes this. Okay, I think it's their, their co-requirements. I mean, one of, the, one of the requirements in the application is, the, uh, is proof of consent for uh, the property owner. Um, it's at the, the bottom, bottom of page four. Yes. So that that yeah, um, number three. Um, and again, the fiscal impact on the on the on our on your report, the staff's report, that is still having a hard time with that four thousand per year with an annual revenue with six hundred. And I know I talked to the city uh, attorney this morning, but um, it, we don't even know who's going to enforce this. So how do we know what it's going to cost us to do it? That's 
I would answer that those are estimates. I agree with you. We, we're, we're taking a stab at trying to get a, a handle on how much potential revenue that there could be. Um, I think that some of those costs were anticipated with additional code enforcement uh, resources that would be needed in order to monitor and enforce um, policies such as this. Um, and to, to, to give an idea of the 600,000, um, I think Tom had mentioned the 20,000 you know, room nights, um, utilizing a, a calculation ratio of that times, I believe, a $250 a night assumption, um, and then a, I believe a 12% uh, TOT tax rate would give us approximately in the neighborhood of 600,000. If we were to go, let's say, with a, a lower number, um, I believe we did either 200 or 187. I can't recall which one was utilized. It'd be more in the neighborhood of like 440,000 a year. So these are uh, estimates that we're approximating based upon information that is we're gathering from those that may not be such forthcoming as we've heard with information, but we're trying to uh, get, get the um, best approximation that we can given the tools and resources we have. Well, I have two concerns. The first concern is this came out of a tragedy. This came out of a trauma. Paul, I'm really sorry for what happened on you and your neighbors there. And um, the intent for me to put an ordinance in place or to, to vote for an ordinance would be to uh, to display some sort of grounds for public safety. Now, if we gain some good out of it, the TOT, that's great. But, you know, if something good comes out of the bad. Um, I'm not so sure that this is going to satisfy anything with regards to public safety. Um, I mean, it's great for the revenue if, in fact, there's revenue. I mean, that needs to be deepened. But I, I just feel like um, this could almost hurt the situation because if we infringe on Airbnb that wants to work with us and wants to um, make sure that they've put their safety factors into place, people are going to go away from the establishment of platforms and do it on their own or do it sneakily or do it around, you know, Craigslist or whatever it is. And that's a concern for me. Um, I would rather focus more on um, the the safety factor of it than the TOT. That's great. If it comes with it, I'm all for generating income, revenues for the city. But um, I'd like to see, Jared, if we could get something that would, would be more like um, the rules if you have an Airbnb or a short-term rental as a neighbor. You know, how, how can the neighbors have a resource to go out there instead of us going after these people that are following the platform. How could the neighbors have a resource or a hotline or something where that then the city could kind of, you know, look at something like that? So. Um, I, I think that that kind of goes to Gina's first question of the night, if I'm not mistaken, that it, it it's intended as a step to help us and to help law enforcement to help kind of regulate what's existing without the tools in place to do it. So um, we would then get the registry. We would then get the names of those that are hosting, uh, have contacts for law enforcement to get a hold of. And so it, perhaps um, could be perceived as moving in the direction of better regulating it and, and starting to craft the tools that we know at least might start to work and over time we might have to refine. And I think those 200 people are going to be here today, gone tomorrow, but the best source of disclosure is your neighbor. So if we could have some sort of hotline or outreach for them, a platform for them, other than just having to have wordsmithing these ordinances and such, I think that that would, we could do both. We can, we I, can move towards the, yeah. the TOT and that kind of stuff. But if there's some sort of way that we could put into place a follow through or a follow up on a complaint because of an Airbnb or a short term rental, I don't want to harp on Airbnb because I'm very grateful for them, yeah. you know, helping us through this. And I think that um, I mentioned earlier, and Tom also touched on it as well, is that the, the community development department would be doing that noticing. So we would be creating a list of the 500 neighbors and notifying them, and it would give some of that information you're speaking of. I don't think that we, uh, when we talked about exactly a hotline, but it would give the, the numbers for law enforcement. It would give them sort of contact information, number one, to maybe resolve it with their neighbor, uh, or move to the next step, which to, to, to sort of rise it up to another level. Yeah, it has to be something that they can feel comfortable with reaching out to. Yeah. And I, if, Go ahead. If I may, I, th I think there's two elements to enforcement. One is criminal enforcement, and the other is nuisance enforcement. And so we were trying to craft an ordinance that, that would take care of both of those. And having the revenue stream then would fund what, what we believe would we, we know the cost of two code enforcement officers. You make a good point. We need to really verify that income to make sure that it, it would satisfy that. But so we're really looking at nuisance as well as then working with the sheriff's office for, for criminal aspects of it. Yes, and, and we coordinated with uh, the sheriff's office as we were drafting the ordinance, and they said that the most useful thing to them would be um, emergency contacts for um, for 
if a disturbance arose. Um, and we've included a requirement that there be two contacts who are available at all, at all times, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whenever the unit is rented, um, such that if the city were to call that contact, the, the contact would have to be on site within one hour um, to resolve any disturbances. Those number, the, the numbers for those contacts would be publicly available to all neighbors. So, the, so if, if there's a disturbance at a short-term rental down the block, you, that you can go on to the city's website or wherever the, the registry ends up being posted and look up um, two people who would be able to come to the, the unit um, and help resolve the issue. But quite frankly, on the, the issue that we had, if they were to call the owner, I mean, that's, not, that's a safety factor for them. I mean, they're gonna, the neighbors are going to call the, the owner of the house, and she's going to put herself or he's going to put themselves into... An, un, an unfit situation. So um, if I might, Ms. Oliva, the idea, especially for law enforcement, since they have worked with the sheriff. Right. So the I big guess. issue um, with the incident that got out of hand was that law enforcement did not have permission to enter the property. This would allow law enforcement to get that permission early on instead of having to come back two or three times in order to visually see a violation of the law and under the fourth amendment or whatever you have probable cause to enter the property so we're taking out the whole probable cause aspect and all you need is permission and you're in and it's handled so that's the aspect of having an established ordinance with the contact information readily available to the sheriff's department. Sadly, the situation that got out of control, law enforcement could not get permission to enter the property, and they did not have the probable cause to enter the property. So those two elements would be addressed in this type of ordinance and I think would make it a lot safer but I do like the idea of some sort of a hotline that neighbors could report uh, suspected Airbnbs maybe you know, somebody's not going through the process and we need to really address who's coming in and out of this city in order to ensure public safety I, I think one other element too before I get to Ms. Schneider there is the um, Transparency of the costs. Uh, you have business license listed. You have the other. Uh, there's no price tag that people should be aware of. Um, clearly, well, that's the total per violation. Per violation, but you, to get a business license, to get the three elements that you need to actually operate um, appropriately, we need to be clear as to what those costs would be. The, the city does have some discretion in setting the cost. I think the city ha has the authority to set a fee for the short-term rental permit to help defray the cost of the program, which includes any extra code enforcement we, we might want to bring in um, and the and any other administrative resources of processing the application, things like that. Um, cities across the state have taken differing approaches to setting this fee. Um, the, the fees will range anywhere. I, I believe Santa Monica is, is pretty nominal. I think um, Napa, I believe, charges $600 uh, um, for a permit. Um, and the incentives there, the, if the city is interested more in recovering its costs, it, it can charge or impose a more um, uh, burdensome fee. If it's more interested in um, kind of getting people in the, in the door, um, it, it may be in the city's interest to uh, impose a lesser fee. Um, well, we do know what about business license costs, right? You can at least put that one up there. So whatever discussing, I think it's important, the cost of inspection, the cost of operating, the cost of enforcement, um, if we were to go down this path, is important. I'm sorry, Ms. Schneider? <clears throat> On the staff memo, on page two, it talks about we're not going to be talking about boarding houses at this point in time and that the sheriff's department and code enforcement are going to work on that. Can we have an idea of when that's going to come back for those of us who are dealing with boarding houses? And do we know if anything has happened at Cedar, on Cedar? So boarding houses are already regulated uh, within our zoning permit, so it's just a matter of en enforcing it. And So the example that came up. Right? No, they, they, they are permitted uh, with a um, conditional use permit 
to the extent that the woman who came the last two council meetings with 60 beds in a duplex is permitted? That is not, that is not allowed. Yeah, that, so, so those uses are not allowed. So what have we done? Because this, our, tonight's report isn't dealing with that at all, so I'm bringing it up. I recognize the irony. I just want to make sure that this particular neighborhood is being taken care of now. Yes, and, I, and to answer that question, that is already legislated. It's a matter of enforcement. So and what have we resources done? Resources and code enforcement in, into getting compliance. So boarding houses are right, not allowed. The question is, what has been done in the last well, two weeks? We <laughs> so, um, truthfully, I don't think anything. But we are working on moving forward with a more rigorous code enforcement. So with the mayor's permission, I'd like to see this issue keep coming back to us until we have a good mechanism. I, I mean, there are people living there that have to find a new home. I recognize that. But there are, there are neighbors who have been dealing with this for a long, whatever length of time. And I just want to make sure that we're not dropping it or forgetting it and that we come up with a resolution as quickly as possible. Uh, if I might, we, we clearly... We have a code enforcement officer right now. I am just dumbfounded that the code enforcement officer, with the support with the sheriff's office, whatever, has not been out there at this point in time to deal with this matter. I, I would like a response within a week if we have a code enforcement officer that's actually working, that they address this one. Um, situation that has been clearly identified to all of us and yet nothing has been done that's and, disturbing and mayor I don't think that this is the only property single family or duplex in town that is operating as a rooming house as a boarding house and I just would like to know that we've got a plan we're moving forward on the plan that we're treating everybody consistently and that we get it done yeah and, and those are our legal uses under our existing zoning code so it's a matter of, like I said, enforcing it and going down the, the path to... And, and to tie... I'm sorry. And to tie in with what Councilwoman Oliva said then, if we're going to develop a phone call system or an on a website-based system to file, which are, in effect, complaints, that we have a, a line item there for if you think the home next door is operating as a boarding house, rooming house, whatever, whatever it's going to be called. Okay, with that, then I have all my questions for you. Okay, reading through the staff memo, um, it talks about these units can operate as long as they have the three, three um, tools. But what if, say, you've got a block and half the houses on that block are operating as temporary short-term residents? So you've, you're saying, okay, well, this house can park two ca cars in front of the street and that house can park two cars. And I think your implication was if you're renting your house out, your garage and your driveway better be for your visitors and you have to go find a place for your car. That's how I took what you meant. That is, that is correct. Okay, that's not clear in here. That's got to be clear on that. And I think that also means for everybody who's renting out homes that their garages better be able to fit the number of cars that that garage is registered as, which is another code enforcement issue. Unless they have the appropriate number of on on-site spaces in addition to the garage for the number okay. of rooms. Got a long, yeah, it's long it's sort of a it's it's a potential fix also to cap to to a degree cap the number of um, potential guests or residents at a at a particular unit as well. Because if, if they only have so many on-site parking spaces and they have to make those available, that then it, it precludes, let's say, if they have a larger number of bedrooms or a lot more guests to come over. It, it, it's another mechanism by which we attempt to um, put a cap on the number of visitors. Well, and the good news is if you go through the process that was explained in here and, and then you're going to find out if the garage has been converted to a residential unit. And I would imagine at that point that converted garage is going to be required to be back to being a garage. So the public needs to be aware of that. And they would not be able to get a license to operate as a short-term residential rental until that all occurred. In this, I'm scrolling. I don't think we've resolved the parking issue. It's a challenge. Um, the 500 feet 
rule for notification. I, I gave Mr. Williams an example. Some of our lot, some of our blocks are designed that if you're talking about four, 500 feet from the front door to the front door of the other properties, you're still missing a lot of things that are angled in. So what do you mean by 500 oh, feet? So it's a, makes you have a program where it goes out and it, it it's going to circle. So that's touched by that 500 foot radius okay. gets included in a mailing list. It's not clear to me when I read this that that was the intent. Can we change the language and make sure that to make it more clear? Understand? Sure, we can take a tip. Accepted that. Yes. Uh, what are our three streets? Our three streets? Yeah, in here we talk about allowing boarding houses and rooming houses in our three areas, and I certainly don't know which, which areas are our three. Uh, which are zoned R3? This is on this page attachment one, page five of the agenda item. It's multifamily. Yeah. Uh, R3 is a, an area totally R3 multifamily? Yeah, it's considered multifamily, so I believe what that's alluding to is an, an R3 zoning district. A general comment when I read through the ordinance language is the complication of taking language intended for hotels and suddenly inserting these standalone or these short term rental units. When I read the paragraphs, they didn't quite fix. And rather than going into detail here, is it okay? My comments are all written specifically noted in a PDF document to give them to you so that when you bring this to planning, when I read these ordinances, they just didn't click to me. Because one is clearly for hotels and one is clearly for single family dwellings. And then you're, we're trying to shove in this language that might need its own section. So if, if I might clarify, I think the, the uh, section of the, the TOT ordinance is an excerpt. And there is a definition in the TOT ordinance that, that defines hotel fairly broadly to include um, these single family homes, the room rented out. And that's exactly my problem. I do not believe that a residential one or a residential two is a place for hotels. I don't like that. I don't want the house next door to me to be a hotel. I didn't. So, I'm, I'm sorry for the confusion. I think there, there's a difference between a hotel as defined in the transient occupancy tax ordinance, which is a very broad term to encompass basically anybody who's renting space in their property. And a hotel is defined in the zoning ordinance, which is more your traditional hotel. Um, so the, um, so I, m maybe I'm unclear about where, which definition of it, hotel But you're see, it's exactly that problem. You'll see all the way through the document, I have comments where we're trying to strict, stick in the short-term occupancies into residential neighborhoods and treating them like a hotel. And they are not a hotel. In the perfect ver version of it, it was a hosted property that wanted to make a little of extra money. They rent out a room. They help the, their, tent, their visitors find the neat places in the community. And they were not intended, maybe Airbnb be intended it, but I don't see it in a residential neighborhood intended to be a hotel or to operate anywhere like a hotel. And so when you've got these references in there, it scares me and it will prevent me from voting on this because it's not, because I just don't believe that we need a hotel on, on Lombard Lane or on Crestview or anything like that. They were not intended to be hotels. They were intended to be neighborhoods. Tom, a lot of mine are, are just um, kind of... If I might, legal counsel, you're referring in reference here to specific code sections, so that's why I'm seeing hotel tax and all of that. Yes, so I believe all the references, I don't think that there are any references to hotel in the short-term rental ordinance. All the references to hotel should be in the, the transient occupancy tax ordinance. Right, in the collecting and remitting of how the yes. platforms. So it's... Ms. Schneider is, um, it's kind of a crossover in that not encouraging hotels in any way, shape, or form. It is listed in the collecting and remitting section. I, I'm just saying it's causing confusion. And if I'm a public member reading through what I can legally do or not do with my property, it's confusing. Uh, if I'm going down and, and looking, again, my concern is for the people living next door, having lived next to war, one of these. And... There's a section in here, and, and I'll bring it to you, give it to you, and it talks about one incident is one complaint. 
Um, hold on one second. Council, do you have something? Well, just to continue, I, I, sorry, Ms. Schneider, I, just two people talking. Just, Go right to ahead. answer your concern, so it, it seems like the taxation ordinance uses the term hotel and uses it broadly over everyone who's renting a room. And I guess your concern is, uh, by instituting this program, we're now collecting a hotel tax from from other other from within these residential areas, and you'd prefer not to have that term used in that way because you feel it causes. I think it opens it, the door. Okay, so the I, we can look at whether we can change the terminology. There's there's just one sensitivity, and that is that um, w the tax. If you ch change the tax too much, it may need a voter approval. So we d we're trying to, 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 I think, spread that. If there's a way we can clarify it, we certainly don't want to cause confusion. So maybe there's a way so that that terminology can be adjusted without a, you know changing the tax structure too much. Um, but but clearly, hotels. Are dealt with in the zoning ordinance as hotels, and they're only allowed in certain zones. And generally, it requires a conditional use permit. So, I, I don't, it's not as though, I, I, you may have a different view in terms of should we have should we have these in residential areas at all? Some cities absolutely prohibit them. But I think the guidance we got from the last meeting was that uh, because people were renting these as a business, that this, the city's view was to permit them but to control them. And so I just make sure that's clear because that, that was our direction unless that's changed. And that's somewhat where I am, but when I read through this and I look at the practicality of what Magnolia could become or what Poplar could become or Lewis, um, these streets that are very close to downtown, that are very close to the transit hub, they could in a very short period of time be nothing but rental property. And, and I'm concerned about that, which brings me to another question of mine. Have any of the other cities that have these have put in an ordinance control the number of non-hosted operations? So I'm more open to mm -hmm. approving a hosted facility. I feel much more comfortable about that than I do about non-hosted ones. Uh, let me be frank. I don't like the non-hosted Airbnbs in a residential neighborhood. So, given that we're trying to learn as we go along, if we have the non-hosted ones, can we limit the number, or can we put in a certain set of additional requirements that if there are problems, they're gone without months or years going by to com collect complaints? Because later on in the document, it says that looking at the incident at Lombardi, that could be taken as one strike against that that person it says all of those incidents are just taken as one thing so if there was a garbage problem a gunshot and screaming that's just one incident not three incidents and that concerns me too that to me that's three separate hits against that airbnb locality and in fact if there's gunshots that means that that property should not be rented out in that fashion it meant that there was nobody there keeping control of that property so when you read that section in there, it's really, it, it means, wow, you could do all, you could break all kinds of things, and it only counts as one problem. Does that make sense, Tom? I, I, I know what section you're speaking. I'm looking at it now. I think we can take a look at. Uh, Which section is that? I I, I'm trying to scroll through quickly, so I'm not right at them. Talking in, about section. I believe it's 7.30.070 7. Uh, letter. Uh, it is, uh, where'd it go? I believe it's, it's uh, E. Am I quoting the wrong section? That's the section I'm looking at. I, I, if it's okay, I can give it to you, and it's all marked as you scroll through the various documents. So another problem that I have is about authorizing agents becoming permittees. And so you've got somebody that lives. Let's use one of the examples that a gentleman brought up. Their house next door, the, the owners passed away. Their son lives in San Diego. They've been renting it out as an Airbnb rather than going the full step and renting it as housing, which to me would be what I would do. And this poor household with their three-year-old are smelling dope all the time. How do, we, how do any of these rules protect that family? Because the way they can rent it out, they could, a non-hosted could rent out for 100 days, which is basically every weekend, which means that poor family has the potential of, of tobacco smoke or cigarette smoke or drugs or just loud partying going on every weekend, and that affects their quality of life. And I don't see, after reading through all of this, how we can help that family on the corner of Elder Avenue, and I can't tell if they're here or not, but they were here two weeks ago. So 
If I might respond, I think there, there are a couple of different mechanisms in the ordinance that would prevent something like that from happening. First, the permittee must be, uh, may only obtain a permit for their primary residence. So if you're totally an absentee landlord, that's, you, you wouldn't be able to get a permit. Um, no, they'd be a no host. Authorized. No, they yeah. wouldn't be able to yeah. permit. You need somebody within one hour, one hour away. Oh, that's okay, I hadn't interpreted that way. That's great. Okay. So even even if you it is your your primary residence, you're only allowed to have a to have a non-hosted, or 100 non-hosted nights per year. So if I'm renting, if I if I live in a house and I, I'm going away for the weekend, um, and I want to rent it for this weekend, that's two nights, and I can I, and I would be able to do that up to 100 nights per year. Uh, but if I don't live in the house, I can't do it at all um, because it's not my primary primary residence. Um, the second mechanism would be the. Um, the permit revocation. Um, this is section 7.30.090. Um, Bottom of seven. So, if the short-term rental is detrimental to the public health, safety, or welfare, um, then the permit can be revoked. Um, that's independent of the three strikes rule, um, and the uh, and something like um, consistently smelling marijuana or, or something like that. I mean, it would be at the discretion of the. Um, the director, if the director finds that this is a detri is this detrimental to public health, then the director could potentially revoke the permit. Um, as to the the three strikes, um, all the in uh, incidents counting as or all all, in all violations from an incident um, counting as one strike. The the idea there is that the ordinance gives us the ability to both cite the the permittee and the the renter. Um, so if the if we go after both the permittee and the renter. We don't want that counting as as two strikes against the um, against the permittee for the purposes of permit revocation. That's only one strike. So that perhaps it wasn't clear, but that was the intention. Well, I think all three points I'm understanding a little bit better. But if I'm having a hard time, then the public who might be putting one of these in or might be coming a host or an absent or a no hosted operation are going to have a hard time understanding it. So basically, can we maybe not in the ordinance, but in the the regulations or the, the application go into a little bit more detail. I know ordinances don't have as much talking in them, but somehow make it more understandable because I didn't interpret if you're a no host, you can't do that if you live more than an hour away because you can just sign that off to a property manager. So I'm living in San Diego. I sign it off to a property manager and property manager responds 30 minutes in a phone call or an hour in place, still got the same problem. So I think one one possible solution would be to put out a FAQ or some some other narrative descriptions once the ordinance is in place that that put that put the kind of legalese into plain English uh, for people who are applying for permits um, and that could address some potential concerns okay I mean that's that's if we can see that and that'll come to the Planning Commission so there'll be more elaboration on that I speak of the fly. I think what you're envisioning maybe is a flyer that we would develop in our planning department that we put out for helping people understand the process and kind of getting them acquainted with it and what they have to go through. Is that what you're speaking of? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we, we do have those in community development. I think if and when an ordinance is adopted and we have, have understand what our approach, we, we could put that together and have that made available for the public. Could we have a sample of home rules? A, a sample of the home, home rules? Home rules. All my tenants get a list of home rules that has grown over the years right down to that I expect them to recycle. If they're renting my house, I, this is what I expect them to do. I'm not sure that we could. The only the issue I see with that is enforcement. I'm not positive that we have really the, um, uh, the the ability or the bandwidth to sort of enforce some of these things that would be really imposed inside of a home. Can we give them, though, as, as something to help the potential hosts then? I got my home rules from the California Apartment Association. I've just grown them over years. That we can look into. That, we can do that. I think the city of Napa does that. Um, I think it's again, it, it becomes a uh, question of enforcement. If if it's it's difficult for a code enforcement officer, for example, to tell that the permittee isn't or the, if the a renter isn't recycling. Um, and I looked at that today, and then I figured that wasn't a place to go. But somebody smoking dope in my house, which makes the walls and the carpet stink, that is something that I would assume most landlords would want to know about. Um, so I think we can go a little bit stronger in that direction. So we do have some operating restrictions that we can definitely add additional um, restrictions to strengthen. Because that still won't help the poor gentleman and his three-year-old trying to keep her safe. So what are we going to do about air quality issues? 
Um, Ms. Schneider, again, I think it was pointed out, just to clarify, detrimental to public health. And that would be where we could address that here, public health, safety, and welfare. Um, I know. That would be, and hopefully, if we can pursue some sort of a hotline, as much protection as we can put in so that the neighbors would be able to report that sort of idea. And then also to suggesting, um, as she said, these house rules people might want to implement should they decide to exercise this. Can I elaborate just a little bit yes. on, on a potential hotline um, as far as it, uh, maintaining that hotline and, and, and staffing the ability for us to effectively uh, uh, show the community that we're, we're, we're addressing their issues? Our intent was is that during business hours that we, that we would uh, um, encourage them to contact our code enforcement number, that our code enforcement officer pulls, uh, that we can uh, react to in a reasonable time frame, and then after hours those calls would be directed to our law enforcement so that after hours where there's disturbances that fall outside more of a, more of a legal issue than a code enforcement disturbance, we would direct them to those phone numbers was our intent um, we could look at doing an additional type of a hotline I'm just wondering if those two might suffice with what you're looking for as as a starting point uh, go ahead Ms. Schneider Do you this is back to the um, primary residential residence information what's to stop someone and then it went into this whole section if I bought a house here in Millbrae and then I bought another house and I put my child's name under the ownership of that one. I now own two homes, yep. but I can use somebody else's name as a primary resident. It's cheating the rules. How can we capture or find that? What if I have a house here, a house in San Bruno, a house in Burlingame, and one in the city? And I'm using all of them as my primary resident. I would imagine that under the county assessor, that's where you get your 700, 000, your 7,000 homeowner exemption. But how else do you catch when people lie on your primary residence? I'm sorry, you can see I'm not very trusting. I had a dead body next to me for two weeks. I'm not trusting. Jared, 7.390. Yeah, I might uh, maybe look to Jarrett for some additional guidance on answering that one. So, Again, I, go ahead. Yeah, so I think our, our definition of primary residence captures that. It, the pr part of the definition of primary residence is, is the, the, the house where you sleep for at least 265 days a year. Um, so if your child is sleeping at that other house 265 days a year, then you can get a permit. Uh, if, you're, if, if your child is living with you and you're just renting that other house, then you would not be able to qualify for a short-term rental permit. So the um, only way we might capture that is if the residents nearby notice something that's a little bit off. So enforcement is a difficulty with a standard like that, um, but there, there, um, I think that's uh, there aren't a number. There aren't very. We're lacking in better ideas in, in terms of, of how to more uh, concretely enforce that. We, we, um, we do have under 7.3.090, section two, the permit T has provided material false misleading information in any submittal required under this chapter. So that's another, another level of enforcement. To catch it. I, I would just note that that term domicile has come into play with regard to politicians who uh, run for office outside of where they live, and it has resulted in some going to jail. So uh, domicile is a, is a legal term. It, it's enforced. You can tell by, as you mentioned, the tax exemption, where you're registered to vote, your DMV uh, registration, all those things. And so, you know, if you, so it is, I think it is a meaningful term. Okay. Under the law, they're very strict about that, yes. Okay, um, moving along, I agree with Councilman, or Vice Mayor Lee, that 1,000 isn't enough. These people are running a business. They can pay more. 1, is that it, Mr. No, the the section it's the only place where they put a thousand in here it's um it's a violation that was is a thousand that's for us the thousand dollars based on what work we're going to do i'm sure that the work that the sheriff's department has already done at lombard lane lombardi lane is over a thousand dollars so i would go back and look at what that cost as an example and that becomes a basis for for whatever that fee should be but i think it feels like a thousand dollars is too little and i I think, prospectively, if I might, um, some time, that was an extreme situation that should never have happened. Uh, but we can, this is a stepping stone. So 
it could be a small step at this point in time, and we would see how it progresses, but we can always come back and okay, I'd increase it. At the same time, this was one thing that finally came up. It took gunshots to get it here. The dead body next to me didn't make the city manager blink an eye. Understood. We are here now trying to address this as quickly as possible. Do you have a few more, Ms. Schneider? I got a few more. Okay. A lot of them. Uh, um, Should I, can I clear up one that might, I think that was misled for you? Sure. On, on the 24 hours, lit, um, they need to be reached within 24 hours. Uh, so like the short, uh, uh, Council Member Schneider says it would solve it because the guy lives in San Diego and he has to live an hour away or whatever it is or a day away, they have to just be reached because I think most of these are used that you're going on vacation for a month to Europe so you short term your your rental out. You can't be to the house within an, an hour I, period of time. I believe the way it's crafted is that we want them to be available 24 hours per day and they have to be able to be on site within an hour. Well, you that's that's impo that's not the, they have to have the that, yeah. Well, I just want to make that clear because you asked. Yeah. I, I appreciate it's in there. that. It's you're running a business. That's you're going to have to right. behave like a business. You, so, you can't take, that's not going to work. Someone may have a business being the property manager or the authorized agent to show up, but we want someone to be there in an hour just for this same reason. And so that's the requirement. It's unrealistic. Maybe that means when you come to planning, you should have more they're explanation that, of right? that just to help. Um, I'm confused about, you've got two bedrooms, you're renting, or you've got a bedroom, you're renting out a bedroom, two people, plus you can have two other people. Who are these two other people? Yes, people that might show up, they're friends. They're, so I, I'm a host, and I rent to two people, and they get to bring their guests? Correct. Okay. How that could be interpreted is, and it's daytime versus nighttime. Daytime, you could have eight people there. Double correct, yeah. So that means the house next door to me could have eight cars. During the daytime. Uh, well, that's why we, have, we try to do a restriction that they can only have their own people with, 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 where they can accommodate the number of cars on site. I don't see how you can enforce that. I don't get that. Plus, if part of what Millbury is doing is we have people sleeping here because they work at night and they're sleeping in a house operating as a boarding house, even if it's only one bedroom, um, we, we could have a daytime population and a nighttime population. I, I, my gut is telling me this could be abused. I don't disagree with your gut. I think it's being abused currently It's because uh, they're currently operating illegally, I think. So we, our understanding was is that we're trying to really take a first stab at really crafting a, a, a difficult to craft ordinance because we're trying to fit, you know, a, a, a square or, you know, a peg or a round peg in a square. So it's something that we're looking to devise that we, th we thought the intent was is to perhaps allow this to permit it to give us more information and to, over time, let's say, build upon what we learn and other communities learn to to have those tools to track this, to enforce it, to to deny the permit when they when they're causing issues, and then give law enforcement and code enforcement more tools. That's how we approached it, um, and it may obviously need more revision over time. Uh, and maybe if we have hosts in the audience when they get up for public speaking, they can explain how this might work at their location. I stayed in bed and breakfast in Europe and in Asia, and I have never brought a guest to someone else's home. That just seems really weird to me. Um, so it, I, I think part of that is, is that what, it, what the two person is, is really also trying to preclude the ability for them to have parties. And so, you know, obviously they're renting out, one person rents it and 200 people are showing up for a party. Um, that gives us a, a mechanism by which we can say two people or more, there's a problem here, this is a nuisance. Um, so I think the intent is, is for that to limit Parties and larger gatherings, perhaps, like we talk about weddings, different things that would not be allowed as a residential short-term rental. Um, however, I, I don't know that it would be all that uncustomary, let's say, for like somebody to go somewhere. And may, they might also be renting. They share the house to have a dinner. I don't know. You know, they might. People get together. You look at it a different way, although let's say I'm a married couple and they have four kids and they want to um, rent a, a two-bedroom. So you've got two, two, plus two. And I did consider that it could have been a family with small children. I just think that that language is problematic. Okay. We clearly understand enforcement is going to be an issue. And it's... It would depend on what the rental... Yeah, I used to rent houses in Tahoe all the time, but I would do whatever the rental agreement allowed. But they allow you to have barbecues with the neighbors in the house. Oh. Yeah. 
Mm, okay, that's a revision. That's... Let's say they're renting numerous houses and then they come over to to get together at some period of time. Mm. Okay, I already asked about the cannabis laws. There's nothing. I, I, we have a cannabis committee. Will the cannabis subcommittee be looking at what? Again, I think we're going back to the public nuisance aspect okay. of it. It's not permitted in public. Okay. Um, uh, may I offer? And I, I just would like to emphasize this is an initial step to something we have nothing for right now, and the goal is really to take these steps and make them work. May I, well, I don't think we're going to have perfection, that's for sure, but something. May, may I offer maybe a... Maybe um, a a small solution that's possible. Um, when I worked for the Air District, um, we always got these type of calls. And you just call the 1-800-334-ODOR line. If the smoke, it could be smoke, wood smoke, smoke, cigarette smokes, pot, whatever it is that's coming outside, they'll send somebody. And they do have mechanisms to, to find um, the, the source. So it's 1-800-334-ODOR. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have more bits and pieces, but I know I'm boring my fellow counsel. So um, when I looked at all the applications, they don't include, um, to me, the application should have more phone numbers on there. There should be uh, a better clarification of the actual owner of the property and whoever they have, have given permission to use that. It should include country. It should include state. It probably does include state, but it doesn't explicitly say that. It doesn't include any kind of driver's license, passport, or um, any other kind of permanent identification number on these people. And I'll give you my example. The, when the house next door was causing its problems, I contacted the county assessor's office. They gave me the address of the owner. It was number two Trump Tower in Seoul, Korea. I sent a certified letter to talk about the problems that were happening because it was a four pages of problems happening at that house. And it turned out that the county had given me the wrong address. So I spent $20 for a certified letter to Seoul, Korea for nothing. What did happen is the tenants at the house on the other side came back because that house had owned that house. He immediately sold that house. So makes you wonder what was going on in that house. The tenants were lovely. But when I did get the other address, it turned out to be the house next door, even though the owners lived in another country and they had their 16 and 17 year old kids living there unchaperoned. So having a better actual real addresses is the only way you can try to enforce this. I could never enforce. I couldn't get the city to help, and I don't want other people to have to be caught in that same thing. So I'd like to see a passport number, a driver's license number, and or um, whatever else, uh, public, per, uh, an identification number of some kind. A what? Maybe a background check or something? Well, or is that a little bit too invasive? No, that's probably, it's just, if you're going to try to match people, if you're going to try to find out are they having this problem in multiple areas, having a unique identifier is important. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of my questions on, on the application. I looked through the application. I said, well, this would be too weak for me as a landlord, but if this is where you want to start, there you go. I'm done. Um, I just want to piggyback on Councilwoman Oliva's comments. Is that the other half of this is uh, you know we're this, we're trying to we're trying to social engineer uh, people's behavior on uh, these short-term rentals. But the biggest, the other big problems is trying to keep these people walking in with guns into our city. So we really need to address that other issue. And this is not part of this. I understand that. But as a comment to staff, I'd like to see us address that issue. Um, the other thing, too, is I want to make sure that uh, people who are running good uh, short-term rentals, you know, and helping their neighbors, but there's always going to be somebody who doesn't like the fact that somebody's renting out their space. So how, how do we balance it out and make sure, I mean, what, what I want to see is some sort of policy to make sure that uh, somebody's just not just using the system to harass their neighbors. And I just want to make sure that you know, everybody's fair, fe uh, treated fairly. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to public comment, if that's all right with everybody. Um, please. Well, I think everybody who's probably going to be speaking tonight are residents of Millbrae. 
the goal here is that we work together and we try to approach this so that we ensure the safety of everyone. And attacking our neighbors or making comments about what other people are saying is not productive. Um, we want to hear from everybody, and we're trying to do the best we can in this situation. But when it comes down to it, we all have to live together here. So if we could... Um, respect each other and listen, because that's the key. We want to listen to everybody's comments. It would be a lot more productive and a lot more neighborly. So if you wouldn't mind, I know this has been an extremely um, traumatic situation that brought this about, and that's why we're trying to act as quickly as possible to get regulations that will work and be understood. And again, nothing's perfect to start with, but we have nothing that we can rely on right now. And that's why we're here. And that's why staff and council have been working so hard and actually Airbnb helping us out too. Um, we are quite aware that there are other companies out there that we are going to have to bring in under this umbrella and make this work. So if everybody would please um, be respectful of one another. That would be exceptionally helpful. I have some speaker slips here now. There are more over there if you would like to, uh, if you haven't filled one out yet. So first, I have a paper clipped one. I think it's a tag team. Uh, my, Mich Michael and Joe? Uh, please, you need to speak to the microphone. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Michael Llewellyn Williams. I'm semi-retired part-time professor at the University of San Francisco. My wife and I have been Airbnb hosts for nearly 18 months. We have never had any badly behaved or noisy guests. The regular revenue has been a lifesaver for us, helping to pay our bills. Um, our concern is anything that's gonna interfere with that revenue will likely cause us hardship. One question I had um, was regarding one uh, element in the, the legislation. I just want to be sure that the $1,000 um, uh, deposit applies to non-present hosts rather than hosts, because that would just be so crazy. Uh, another question I would have is, we are full-time hosts. Uh, we've always had very good um, guests. But let's say um, I have a very sick nephew. Uh, perhaps in a week or two, uh, we're going to have to take um, off to the UK and uh, go to his funeral. Um, for those two nights that we're away, we're always going to have a house sitter because we have our dogs and all of that good stuff. Um, does that mean we're going to have to register as non-hosts for the five days we're going to be away? Um, I would hope not. Um, but I, all I would ask is you to... to take note of what we've said and uh, thank you for that. Joe wants to say a few words. Yes, and and very interesting to listen to everything tonight, but our, our Airbnb, it's been so wonderful working with Airbnb. We have had no seamless, seamless processes. We have great dialogue with the people that uh, inquire about our property. It's a house, it's a private suite, It's they have a washer and dryer, private entrance, we do have lovely dogs, we have so many people that adore meeting those dogs, and we've met some wonderful people, and we get great reviews, we're a, we get five stars, we're a super host, and we just really enjoy it, and it's kind of just so special to open up that extra, it's a downstairs suite in our home, and it's just wonderful to be able to have people enjoy it. We have a gorgeous view and uh, I hate for it to go away because I do think we really, we really, really make a wonderful contribution to Millbrae. And I know these people, we have lots of property of where to go to, to eat and whatnot. And it's, it's been a game changer. So it's reason why we love being in Millbrae. And we've been here for eight years and it's special. Thank you well, very much. I hope we can uh, make it all work. Thank you, and we're sorry about your relative, too. Thank, Thank you much. You. Um, 
And so and I'll remind people too, there are lights up there. You have three minutes. Donald Kalkin. Mayor and council members, my name's Don Kalkin. I've been a member of this community for about 15 years. My kids went to school here. Um, I just want to tell you about my experience. Uh, uh, it was on February 25th. I'll just read my notes from that day. Um, this also goes to, with uh, Ms. Schneider mentioned the hotline. Well, the best hotline was 911, and we used it, and it didn't work. Here's what happened. Uh, my wife, Valerie, was downstairs asleep at 1130. Uh, there was a big party that started. I called 911 at 1227. Um, I reported people in the street. They were drinking, yelling, screaming. There was a possible fight. There was three men around my cars in the front of my house and in my front yard. One of them was peeing on my lawn. The other one had a bottle of Hennessy brandy in his hand. That ended up on the hill across the street. It was picked up three days later. Um, I requested a unit be sent to my house when I dialed 911. I, I, I ID'd myself, my address. I said I couldn't see much uh, else from where I was, and I hung up. A moment later, I got a call back and was asked the same questions. I repeated the information about who I was, where I was, and what happened. My wife came upstairs and told me that she was upset. I told the dispatcher when I was on the phone with him the second time that I had already given him all the information, please send a unit, and I hung up to talk to my wife about what was happening downstairs on the other part of the house. I told her the police were on their way, but they didn't show up that I know of. I say that because, um, well, I didn't stay and watch out the window the entire time, but the party lasted in the street till 4.30 in the morning. I would assume that if the police came, something might have been done. I told my wife the police on the way, but they didn't show up, not that I know of. The party continued till approximately 5 a.m. outside in the street, the rear yard, and the entire house. At one point, there were about 50 to 60 people raving and screaming outside. Parking was taken completely up and down the block with broken glass left in the middle of the turnaround at the end of the block. Other garbage was scattered about the street, sidewalk, and hill, and I sent pictures in to the city to show how much garbage and crap was left, including down at the creek which is, we have a, a wonderful creek in the backyard, and it gets a lot of weed and overgrowth at certain times of year when the creek isn't really active. But you could see cigarette butts out there. There were beer cans or cigarettes. It's a matter of time. We're, right where I live, it's a little tinder box. And it's just going to take one cigarette butt. And there's numerous. You can go out and count them on the street right now. It's going to be one. And then there's going to be houses on fire on Millbrae Avenue, and somewhere up and down Hillcrest. Mr. Culkin? If, yes? Did you wrap up there and this? Sure, I'm sorry. No, um, don't be. Um, I had spoken with the owner and when he first moved in, uh, I thought it was gonna be he and his wife as he had told me it was gonna be, I was going great, you know, I got some good people moving in next door to us, we'll have some peace. And it turns out that the post office sent the wrong, the tax paper, uh, tax papers and it went into my mailbox and it turns out it wasn't he and his wife. It was he and three other people and an LLC. So it's a limited liability corporation. The house was purchased so it could be done as, I'm assuming, uh, as an Airbnb. It wasn't done to, you know, for the neighborhood or to add anything to the community. It was to add money to the people's pockets who are the LLC. So there is no way to police that. If something did happen, how am I supposed to sue an LLC? If there is a primary residence, 
that's supposed to stay in the house, well, it's an LLC. It's, you can't actually go after anybody. There is no responsible person. So these are things that it just doesn't work. It can't work. And we're zoned R1. I would never have bought a beautiful house up in the hill if I know it was going to be a hotel. He's done additions or he's trying to do add-ons to the house without building permits. He's on hold right now for one. And nothing has been done legally, and this is just going to get worse. And there is no respect with this, as far as I'm concerned. He's not done permits, and this is just putting money in his pocket, not... He's not doing anything for the city of Millbury. And I don't sleep well at night because of it. The neighbor on the other side, his renters are threatening to leave. They don't have peace anymore. There's been numerous parties that have not been addressed. Mr. Kogan. Thank you very much. Yeah, and could, I'm sure the sheriff's department there would be very interested in getting some further information from you. That well, should I, I do have the dates and times. That's and great. And I would like to know, since I did speak to dispatch, it is recorded. Why wasn't there? Is, who's responsible for not showing up? So would we. Thank you very much for being here. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Larson. Greetings, Mayor Pappin, Vice Mayor Lee, Council Member Holliber, Council Member Oliva, and Council Member Schneider. It's wonderful to see you as always. You know, I had a chance to review everything that was talked about tonight, earlier this morning. It was, it's great, and I really, really appreciate and want to thank uh, everybody for giving a, a first step on how to resolve these problems. And I really feel for everybody who's here who's a homeowner, but, and also for everybody who's an Airbnb or short-term uh, uh, host. Uh, but there are some concerns that uh, were brought up to me that I told everybody that I would bring up uh, tonight. Now, a lot of these items have already been touched on, which is wonderful. Each of you have touched on uh, these items, but I just wanted to emphasize that these are very, very important to, to various neighbors and community members that I've talked to. Non-hosted uh, that is a very, very big problem with a lot of people. Uh, the fact that some houses would be uh, not occupied uh, by uh, an owner or somebody who is supposed to be living there as, as, a, as a resident is a very, very big problem. And a lot of people don't like the non-hosted uh, idea. Uh, if it's possible to have non-hosted Prohibited? That would be ideal. Um, so that's one point that uh, needs to be touched on, please. And then other people have talked about the R1 through R4 zoning. I know that uh, you were talking about that tonight. There were various people that were touching on that, which is uh, important. Uh, apparently, uh, R1 and R2 are already uh, prohibited from having uh, these types of short-term rentals. So that's one other thing that people are concerned about. Um, 100 days. Now, is that 100 days just during the year altogether, or is it 100 days consecutively? Can somebody rent out their home as an Airbnb or short-term rental for 100 consecutive days, or is it scattered throughout the year? And also, one thing that uh, is supposed to be effective in other cities that goes along with that is n a, a renter is not allowed to to stay for no fewer than 100 days. Now, I'm not sure how that works. That might be something that you could look into. That might be helpful and might be able to clarify uh, uh, how that works with other cities. Um, now, uh, there was a report. Somebody had called me and told me about this. Apparently, I'm the, uh, the, the 800 hotline. And uh, uh, there is a concern on Magnolia 321 Magnolia Avenue. There were reports of bunk beds and other types of activity there. So that's something that needs to be looked into. And I uh, told uh, this particular homeowner that I would mention that to you. Uh, enforcement, I know that's been talked about over and over and over, but uh, full-time staff, some sort of hotline to have 
available for residents and also some sort of recourse too, or a call back, some, some way for residents to talk about problems. I know I have my red light. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm um, finishing up ghost houses. That was another concern. People are talking about how these ghost houses are uh, scattered now all over Millbrae, uh, non-occupied homes. Uh, the houses end up being uh, deteriorated after a while, and gardens end up going to weed. And uh, car break-ins, this is something that might be uh, of concern, too, that uh, might be uh, part of the Airbnb problem. Uh, nobody knows, but they seem to have arisen all at the same time. So if, if you could please d address these issues, uh, something that might be uh, uh, comforting to the neighbors and to the residents of Millbrae, that would be very, very helpful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Paul Peekler, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. I'm, I apologize if I mispronounced your name. I spelled Paul. Oh, Brian. What am I doing? I'm sorry. You know, you spelled it Brian. Excuse me. My apologies. Oh, well, no worries. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and uh, uh, City Council people. Appreciate your time. So, uh, I'm just, I did that brief bio. I'm just going to say, I, I did that, uh, this is my second time here. Uh, I introduced myself, I'm just going to read it so I can get uh, my time out of the way. I introduced myself and uh, provided a brief bio at the last meeting. My name is still Brian Piegler, and uh, I'm still a property owner in Millbrae. Uh, I do live on uh, Elder Avenue. I'm not so inclined to give my, per my address now after uh, <laughs> some of the things I heard, but uh, it should be noted, uh, I've been on uh, that side of the podium for 30 years. Uh, wearing uh, a uniform of that nature, I know how it, what it is, and I've been uh, you know, uh, yelled at, screamed at, and and all those things, and I do not want to seem or act aggressive uh, in any uh, fashion. But we are that house on Elder with the four-year-old uh, child. Uh, thank you for uh, mentioning that. Uh, <clears throat> so in, in regards to uh, what the uh, planning department uh, just came up with, I didn't, uh, I, I don't know, maybe uh, the, the guy, Mr. Larson, got a copy. I didn't get a copy, uh, a chance to even copy or review that, uh, that uh, uh, draft or, or appreciated that before uh, we came to the meeting, but it didn't. So, but with all due respect, um, who cares about the hostess property? I don't. I know Mr. Lee uh, made an issue about that. Who cares about any damage uh, to the hostess property? Who cares? Honestly, who cares about the, the safety of the host? Sorry, to be honest with you, because that host wants to play Russian roulette. You know, if they like to do that with their own safety and their own property, let them go ahead and do it. Right? You can play all the Russian roulette. Uh, that you like, uh, but uh, I'd rather not have the host designate and dictate whether or not me and my family are going to play Russian roulette, right? So, uh, that 500 feet is is something that uh, the gentleman here uh, spoke to, as the, those are the people who are going to be notified within 500 feet. That's a ridiculous number, to be honest with you. That's no number. I mean, how far is that next bullet going to travel? All right, that next bullet can travel from that side of Millbrae all the way to the other side of Millbrae. It can travel the distance of Millbrae. You know what? Everybody in that neighborhood should be notified that an Airbnb is coming into that neighborhood. I'm going to talk five, six, seven blocks because those are all the people that those extra cars are going to be parking in front of their house. Those are all the people that are going to be affected by the late night parties. Those are all the people that are going to be affected. It's not 500 feet. It's five thousands, thousands of feet. It could be five miles. All right. So that's all I have to say on that issue. Uh, what I wrote, and uh, I don't know if the red light's on or not, but is real quick that uh, approximately one month ago, I saw the local news broadcast, and I read the direct quotes. This has already been covered, but this is what I was going to talk about today before this uh, issue was uh, placed before us. And uh, it covered that, the local papers covered that alleged shooting. Uh, Mayor Pappin said, and was quoted multiple times, uh, regarding short-term rentals and specifically Airbnb, that Airbnb is a business and a business license is required to operate in Millbrae. 311 Elder, Elder has been operating solely as a business associated with Airbnb since at least September 2017. I was able to establish that the operators did not and do not have a business license to operate in Millbrae, a business in Millbrae. So pro approximately three weeks ago, following the directions of the Millbrae City employees and many confusing past the buck visits to City Hall, 
I filed a code ordinance violation complaint with the planning department and gave them all the information about the owners and what, what's what been happening, the whole, they had everything. You know, absolutely to no avail, right? I even heard you, Ms. Pappen, tell somebody to contact me last, and you know, I haven't been contacted. All right, so uh, no follow-up with me, no home business, no phone call, nothing, which I find ridiculous because when I sat on that side, of your side, you know what, there's no way I would tell somebody to do something and not do some follow-up. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. You know, it's, it's, it's a definite, as the gentleman talked about here, just totally disrespectful. That, we're already going through what we're going through and then get treated like that by the city. Uh, I ask that a moratorium be placed on all non-hosted Airbnbs of which the property owner is not living on the premises, operating in Millbrae until something is accept some kind of acceptable decision is made. And by acceptable, I mean not just acceptable for those associated and profiting from with Airbnb, I mean, something, some form or fashion, how can you have these meetings and be working with Airbnb and no citizens input is part of that. There's no uh, community action group involved. Uh, I just don't understand uh, how that can happen and uh, why the, the citizens who live and have, or, or, or who are victimized by these places aren't part of this, uh, the, the process of, of trying to find some acceptable uh, compromise. I find it incredulous. And in, in the least, in, in, I believe it's most likely illegal that we have no say so in this matter. So that's all I have to say, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Julia Rolskin. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm an Airbnb host. I've been doing it for um, a little over two years right now. For me, to be honest, Airbnb is not a profit. It's uh, just the only way to stay in a neighborhood. I'm a single mom. Um, I've been saving for a very long time to move in here so my daughter can go to the Green Hill School. Um, and B&B is, if it's somehow regulated and we are not able to continue it, we'll have to get out of the neighborhood. And again, I never had for two, over than two years, never had ex bad experience with the guest. If I had any concerns, ABB has a hotline where I, I'm able to call and they would take an action right away um, by asking guests to leave. I think um, Ms. Olivia was so right when she pointed out that actions should be taken um, for the safety uh, rather than controlling all Millbrae residents who are trying to stay here. Not everyone was so lucky to buy the property 30 years ago. Now, as you know, prices are crazy and any young families who are trying to get in here, um, it's super, super hard and short-term rentals are very helpful and I think Airbnb does a really good job. Um, and as some of you mentioned, there are other ways around and I think the more regulations are gonna be in place, the people would be not following them but trying to find the ways to avoid. And I think it's pretty obvious and uh, I think it would create more danger for the entire neighborhood. Um, thank you. Thank you. That's the final speaker slip in this. Anyone else would like to? Okay. Um, the public has brought up some deeply concerning issues, um, which Mr. Williams, you knew here, but Mr. Piegler was here again last week. What does it take for issues like this to be addressed? We have the Sheriff's Department here. We have city staff here. For people to take time out of their lives and not get the big pay that we all do here. Uh, you know, this is, it's just not acceptable that these issues are not being addressed. In particular, the ones that are as 
been clearly identified as public safety issues right now. Okay, um, Mr. Williams, can you off? We've had two residents up here that the safety is right now at issue. Can you offer us some sort of assurance that we will? Besides taking the microphone apart, yeah. Um, yes, we. I understand, and, and uh, I will make sure that we provide focus and have it the top priority uh, beginning tomorrow morning to not only investigate um, the situation on Elder, I, I would like to talk to the resident, get a little bit more information on exact residences, um, addresses, that type of thing, but, but I can assure you we will make it the top priority. Um, I'll personally work with code enforcement to make sure that uh, we're on top of it and work with the Sheriff's Department to find out a little bit more information on, on what we can perhaps do to uh, see how we can improve and provide better enforcement. Here's his personal information. We have it. I'm going to hand it to you, okay? So I don't want this buried, and I would like it addressed as quickly as possible. Um, it's just it's frustrating to us as electeds and it's frustrating to the residents that they take time out of their busy lives to come here and describe these situations to us and then it just goes into a black hole and it's just not acceptable um, so some things need to be done and we need to at our next meeting know that this matter was addressed and I hope that the chief will address Mr. Colkin's situation. Um, a, far, a party going on till 5 a.m. is not acceptable. I know this happened a while ago, but again, completely not acceptable. So we would like a formal response that these matters have been addressed. Now for the ordinance, um, we've heard from both sides here, and I think not everybody's going to be happy, but unless we get something on the books that we can address and work with, then we're just going backwards. And I don't think any of us want that to happen. It, ha it serves a serv service for some, but we need to work on how those who want to take this Russian roulette chance with their homes... Um, don't interfere with the quality of life of those around them. So, I think this is a first step. Um, I would like some further information on homes. Now, for those, for the information we know, a lot of homes in Millbury are owned by a trust or an LLC, as was described here. Um, this ordinance is specifically being set up that if you are not, if this is not a primary residence, you are owned by a corporation, then we have some way to crack down on the people like this LLC that's operating within our city. That would be prohibited. You just don't buy a home that you can turn around and Airbnb it. Is that, that is my understanding with this ordinance. Am I correct? That is correct. Okay, so that's a starting point here. Um, I do think if we pursue this um, as it is written at this point in time, we need to have uh, legs and muscle in enforcing it as quickly as possible. And this is, I'm just speaking here and the rest of the council can speak up, but I think this is a good first step. This is, and if it doesn't work, we can come right back and just do the complete opposite here and say absolutely not. But we have residents on both sides here. And our primary goal is public safety and not having the people that are taking advantage of these platforms interfering with the quality of life of others. So the accountability has to be a primary focus in whatever way, shape, and form staff can come up with here. 
what was mentioned is there's a code enforcement number that will be clearly labeled on these flyers or the sheriff's department or 911. If that doesn't work, I mean, we need to know that code enforcement is going to be responding within 24 hours. Or that, I mean, that needs to be clearly spelled out on these forms. And there has to be some responsiveness. And I s suspect that um, Ms. Hildebrandt or someone there, we're going to need a service that is able to track these companies, is able to let us know what platforms are operating within our city, some sort of way that we know what's happening here. Um, so I don't want to do this half-assed. Um, if we go down this path, and there seems to be some consensus, I want it to be enforceable, and I want it to be something that the residents know they can rely on if their quality of life is being negatively impacted. And I would suspect that maybe, how long does it take to get something before the Planning Commission? How long does it take to make this operational? And how long does it take for us to see if it's working? Because public safety means we have to act quickly and make sure this works. So if we come back in two months, if this happens to be approved tonight, it goes to planning, it's enacted, we really need to have the second step, which is the tracking and enforceability of this. And staff needs a full-time code enforcement person. We need to know this is going to work or we're just sitting here doing nothing. So let's have a plan that has an end game that works and that we can turn back in three months and say, is this working or isn't it? What's happening? But right now we have nothing that we can track or enforce, and that deeply concerns me. Any comments from anybody else? Well, I don't think I'm prepared to pass this tonight because I think there's way too many holes in this. Uh, I mean, as far as uh, the simple thing like 321 Magnolia Avenue, I just looked up the owner. So, I mean, that's how simple this is. I, I think that um, there's a lot of what you said is 100% I'm behind it with public safety. But yet when you say things like people that own, they buy their homes to rent it out as a business, yes. But that's not based upon the title of an LLC. People buy their homes and have it in an LLC for other purposes than an Airbnb or a business. So I think that to, um, to say tonight we're going to push this forward, I, we talk about half, yeah, half asked, is that what the word you used? <laughs> yeah, it was. We need, we need to clean this up. It, it, I, I, would, I would propose, which I think works really well with this group, is a subcommittee to sit down with staff and look at all the notes that were taken um, and, and come back to the five of us before it goes to um, planning. Ms. Schneider and Mr. Holland. Okay, I'm not overly fond of subcommittees because I feel that that has too much power and it gets back to the full council as a done deal. In terms of how quickly to turn this around, you, staff, you've been given quite a few things to clean up on this, and some of it is auxiliary documents that can help support it. How quickly could that, and, and we can't approve it tonight. It's my understanding this is just for information and to get more comments. But the next planning commission is the beginning of June. Is that too soon? So we're looking at the second planning commission meeting in June. Can we make that? Okay, I've been talking to some fiscal people who think that we can go to Airbnb and other platforms and collect past TOT. We haven't talked about that at all. Can that be discussed at that time? Um, I think Airbnb, as part of their standard voluntary collection agreements, they, they ask cities to waive uh, past GOT. 
Um, so that well, they can ask anything they like. I'm not happy with that. So I would like to go back. I would like when this comes back to us to also look at collecting past TOTs. They've been running a business. They've been making a profit. They can look at paying past TOT. So we're looking at the second planning meeting in June. Can we or in May in June? Can we do that? We're going to be passing a budget in June. Can we look seriously at getting at least one full-time code enforcement officer for a range of code enforcement issues? We brought this up two years ago at the beginning of a two-year budget process. Uh, Wayne and I were the only two that wanted to see a full-time code person. We got voted down, but it's time to look at bringing at least one full-time code enforcement person. We're in the budget process. That, hap that could happen now in the cycle. What else needs to be done? I want to see this moving now. I don't want to see this going to a subcommittee. I don't want to see this going to, you know, at least start getting a working draft that you can nitpick apart instead of playing up here in the concept level. Thank you. Mr. Holder? No, I think, I think we're in agreement on that. Um, this is, it is a working draft now, and I think what my, my understanding is staff was looking for direction from the council uh, for what to um, change to the draft that has been proposed to us, and then that would go to the planning commission and then back to the council for final approval. So a couple more opportunities for making final changes. Um, I do agree with that on the, the code enforcement. I think we'll be discussing that in the budget hearing later um, this evening. Um, and then also getting some type of a service on on board to uh, identify all the properties. It, it sounds like staff's already been working on that. Vice Mayor Lee, well, I, I you know this is a complicated issue, and I thank staff. I don't I, for approaching this subject. It's not easy, and it's, it's new, so we're kind of kind of trailblazing here. So um, I think if we just keep. It just needs some, I think it needs some tweaking in my, you know, in some of the comments I made uh, to try to ensure that everybody's um, playing by the rules and that uh, everybody is doing their fair share. And I'm not just talking about Airbnb, I'm talking about all the, all the, all the platforms. Um, and also, I just make sure we address, um, Chief, address the other issue about uh, the bad elements coming into Millbrae and taking advantage of, you know, whatever system, whatever they can to have wild parties, which we don't, we're trying to discourage and try to keep them out, right? So um, they'll find a way. It doesn't have to be any sort of Airbnb or anything, but we need to address that other issue. I have a question. People have already admitted they are operating now and they are operating in violation of at least the business license. So would anybody like to give some advice to those watching who are currently need to go get a business license as to how they can at least achieve that part of it? Yeah, sure. I think that's the irony of the discussion tonight. Um, a lot of the units and the addresses that were brought up this evening are, are currently operating illegally. So it's not a matter of having an ordinance to regulate them. We just need to enforce the ordinance, and that's a code enforcement issue that well, right now, it's an informational issue, so I would like that it be posted on the website as quickly as possible. How someone gets a business license if they are currently operating as such while we proceed. As a host or as a platform? If you are using your home as an Airbnb, our current regulations require. <clears throat> the city manager raises a good point. Um, I'm not sure our business license will issue to someone who's operating an illegal use. So um, I, I think we need to double check on that process. So, um, but we can work that out. And we'll, I think it'd be helpful for the city to put a notice on the website to be an Airbnb hosts, just informing them of this process. Uh, and and we'll, we'll give them the, the guidance on the business license. But, excuse me one second, but the, a long-term or short-term lease is profitable. What do you so, mean profitable? I'm not talking about profitable here. You said here. they're running a business. If you're, if you're renting your house out. Right. So I think that let's, let's be cautious before we tell everybody to go get business licenses. Right. No, we're going yeah, to check good, on that because I, I believe our 
office doesn't issue the business license until they've gotten a sign off from all of the city departments and you can't get one for operating a short term rental in, in the, because it's not legal in any, any place in the city. Well, I don't appreciate the misinformation that I was given when this first came up then because I was told you needed a business license. So the misinformation is not appreciated now that it's been explained. So well, yeah, let's get a notice. I'm, I'm looking into this. I'm just getting my head wrapped around all this. Code enforcement is definitely an issue in this city. There is no question about it. And that's something that I will be addressing, both in terms of who we contract with and the lack of performance, and as mentioned tonight in the budget, making it a priority. Um, I don't think there's any disagreement. It's, uh, it, it's a management issue and, and a utilization issue that, that we will discuss you know, within the departments and, and administration, but I, I hear you loud and clear. Um, uh, my point is that enforcement right now is that these uses are illegal, so we can go out and we can enforce them and shut them down because legally under our ordinance, they're not allowed. So, you know, that's an issue I think that necessitates the rapid process and approval of this ordinance so we can accommodate and get them legal and have enforcement. And so I think, the faster we can get it back to you, the the better, and so that that's what we will that's what we will do. Um, we'll try to make the planning commission um, within the month of June and and bring this back to the city council for adoption uh, in July. If it comes back to the city council, we would like it to be accompanied with a service or operator that's going to be tracking and assisting with the enforcement. Okay. I don't want to have to wait another month after that to just see some action here yeah. does staff have a clear um guidance on how to proceed i do yes sure. yes we do all right it says action though i guess we're just giving you action we don't take a formal vote Okay, so and we will, were we gonna get something at the next meeting or we are gonna get an update to the two residents, I hope. Right. Um, I heard that direction. If you want this to move as fast as possible, the next step would be to go to the Planning Commission. Um, if, if you wanna have more direction as to what is sent to the Planning Commission, then, then we would bring it back to you. I think we have enough and I think the process of moving through the Planning Commission and back to Council gives you opportunities to have input. I'll just note that you know a, a, a chunk of this is zoning, and so those are noticed hearings. So there's a 10-day notice, that, you know, and, and you gotta publish that before the Planning Commission, and the same thing before the, for the Council, and you can't publish the notice until the Planning Commission's already met. So you're looking a minimum of 30 days to, right, and then another 30 days for the ordinance to come into effect. So we're talking 60, 75 days minimum to have it in effect does give staff time to get the service plan together but that's that's just the reality okay so with no objections we're asking that it proceed to the planning I'm fine with that. okay miss schneider just a comment um in none of these reports have we done included any comparison of what we're talking about tonight to what other cities have done sometimes in my experience that has helped both the public understand where our city might be in comparison to others i'm bringing that up under the garbage contract but maybe you could include some information about what the other cities the lead cities and then the average cities and cities that look like us as we were drafting the ordinance, we did review a number of uh, best practices from other cities. Our ordinance, or the proposed ordinance is based most strongly on, on Napa and Redwood City. Um, we felt those were local jurisdictions that had um, some similar issues. Um, we can definitely provide more information as to what other cities are doing. I'm guessing Napa is more similar because they're very concerned that their housing stock is being turned into vacation rental because I have friends with vacation rental. So I understand that. But I do think, and this is where I'll agree with the mayor, being right next to the airport and being next to the trains and someday with high-speed rail, it does make us unique in that. So if we can maybe find another community that is similar in being next to an airport might help. Okay. And Oakland's not close enough. It's got to be a city that's smack dab next to the airport. Uh, we can look into that. Okay, moving on to item 10. Resolution approving a new maximum 
garbage rate schedule. Always fun. Miss Ryder, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. This evening, I'll provide a review uh, of what? the... Hold on Do you want me to second. wait? I'll wait. Okay. And Mr. Holliber wanted a brief break. Okay, let's just take a couple of minutes here. Go ahead. <laughs> Back in five, please.
Welcome back to the Millbrae City Council. Ms. Ryder, we are on item number 10. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. This evening, I'll provide a review of the proposed garbage rate schedule. I'll first provide some background information. In 2009, the City Council at that time approved a new franchise agreement with the South San Francisco Scavenger Company for an eight-year term. That agreement was set to expire on November 1st of 2017, and a new agreement was approved in June of 2017. The franchise agreement requires that rates are reviewed and adjusted accordingly each year, with the new rates becoming effective on July 1 of each year. The franchise, the franchise agreement calls for a three-year rate setting cycle. For the first two years, the maximum allowable garbage rates are based on any changes to the consumer price index, the CPI. Every third year, any potential changes to the garbage rates are based on a rate survey of a pre-selected group of cities. Last year's rates were adjusted according to the CPI and were adjusted at 2.62% for all service categories. This fiscal year represents the third year in the rate setting cycle according to the franchise agreement. The scavenger company conducted a rate survey of a pre-selected group of cities according to the franchise agreement based on specified levels of services. Staff verified the submitted survey, verified it, and worked with the scavenger company to make adjustments for discrepancies. This year's survey resulted in increases to the residential and commercial garbage rates in the range of 2.92 to 5.69%. And I'll give some examples of these rates. The majority of residents use a 32-gallon garbage cart. The result of the survey was a $1.88 increase, which is a 5.69% increase for a total cost of $34.93 per month. And that includes all services, all recycling, organics, twice a year on-call, bulky pickup. And that's the residential rate. For the commercial 32-gallon cart, the survey resulted in a $0.94 cent increase, which is a 2.92% increase to the existing rates for a total cost of $33.18 per month. For the commercial two cubic yard container, the survey resulted in a $12.62% increase to the existing rate for a 4.14% increase at a cost of $317.22 per month. The 14 yard temporary uh, debris box resulted in an increase of $21.94 for a 3.49% increase to the existing rate and total cost of $650.81 for a seven-day period. Last, for the compactor rate, the increase was $3.05 to the existing rate, which is a total of 4.88% increase and total cost of $65.57 per compacted yard. Approval of the proposed garbage rates will increase the franchise fees for the general fund as well as the Integrated Waste Management Enterprise Fund as included in the staff report. Upon approval of the proposed rates, the South San Francisco Scavenger Company will put a notice in the uh, customer bills for the June billing notifying them of a rate increase. It's staff recommendation to adopt a resolution approving a new maximum garbage rate schedule, which would become effective on July 1 of 2018 in full accordance with the franchise agreement with the South San Francisco Scavenger Company. I'm happy to answer any questions. And we also have Doug Button, president of the South San Francisco Scavenger Company, and Paul Formosa, the chief financial officer, who can also answer any questions. Very nice report. Thank you, Ms. Ryder. Nice to see you. Questions from the council? None for me. Ms. Schneider. Okay. Um, South City Scavenger, you know I love you. You know I, I'm very, very happy that we have dual stream. And for my fellow council members, China has been blocking more and more commodities. And now nationally, all of the cities that went to sin single stream are being, which means you throw your recyclables, all of them, into one container, single stream. Um, they're being told, maybe it's time you should go to dual stream. So we are very, very fortunate to be in a dual stream situation. 
Okay, that's my good news. So, and, I, and I love the food scrap recycling. Here's the bad news. A year ago, when we were talking about uh, extending your contract an additional eight years, there were some things that were identified and that this council agreed that Joan Kassman and I would continue to work with you all to get them done. One of those was making sure that the black yard waste carts are no longer black, that they're green, as our public education materials claim they should be, and that all of the containers have the appropriate signage on them so customers know what they should and shouldn't put in them. It's kind of the basic baseline education on that. Some of that has happened. I talked to your staff. We had dinner at the Progress Seminar and we talked about this and I, I know your staff want to do this, but it hasn't happened yet. And now you're coming back for a rate increase. Now I'm sure the rate increase is due to fuel and labor and other costs, but our staff reports don't really go into that type of detail that I'd like to see, but I'm only one council member. But I really would like to see that yard waste with the related food scraps are available in appropriate containers with appropriate signage at not just single family dwellings, but multifamily dwellings at any apartment or condominium complex and at all of our businesses. And that there's push for education to get those businesses participating because I will tell you, I can walk the alleys, some are and most aren't. So we've got this great program and we're not using rate setting to get our contractor to do as much as they can. And I want to keep you and I want to keep our customers happy. And you're asking for a pretty significant rate increase, especially on residential customers. What are they getting for it? And why haven't we gotten the things that we talked about a year ago? I can say that residents are getting a full range of the typical services in, in the garbage, recycling, organics. When the company had switched to or, or had expanded to add yard trimmings, what happened is households were using the large 96-gallon black carts. This is many years ago. And in an effort to reuse them and not create another disposal problem, those became the yard containers. And the standard became a 32-gallon cart for residents. So it was a reuse of those containers. Uh, and as customers need new containers for yard trimmings, Anyone can get that green card and anyone can get that decal. And as a follow-up from last year, we did do outreach. Scavenger did do outreach to, uh, to uh, let people know they could get the decal to put on their containers. We have a public service announcement on MCTV. Um, the scavenger company has included articles within their newsletter. And a way to keep costs down was to keep using those containers. And I know in the outreach I do, I don't specify necessarily that it's always a green cart because I know some of them are black and, and they are being reused. And so those decals are available for everyone. I, I'm confused, Ms. Schneider, what the difference makes. I mean, I know mine's black and I know what goes in there. When you're part of the, what confuses the public most often, especially in multi-use areas where they move around more frequently is the color of containers makes a difference in knowing where to put things. So believe it or not, the colors are important. That's why the colors over time have become pretty standardized. Okay, so but, um, so I, I would suggest at the same time, we agreed a year ago that we would be moving forward. And this is the first time I haven't gotten any information about that happening. Now, if we're talking about apartments on our next door, one of the communities that I, that can be very verbal, um, they have talked about not having access to food scrap recycling. Now, my question is, is that because the apartment manager uses a landscape company, then therefore they have no green waste at all? Or is it because they don't have the right container? Any way you look at it, those customers, those residents, don't have access to a really terrific program. Yes, so any multifamily dwelling condominium can have organic service. It really is up to the manager and the owners of these facilities. And so uh, in some Wait, cases... I'm sorry, the law states five units or more must have certain services. They must have yard trimming service for, for the five yards. That's AB 1826, yes. And so 
most of the multifamily dwellings, when, when AB 1826 came about, we did survey, worked closely with Scavenger, identified all of the multifamily dwellings, which ones needed service. And in, in the landscaping, most of them are off-hauled, and, uh, and, and that's the situation. Everyone is eligible to have the service, though. It, and for for so associated I've cost, had, I've had people write to me saying that they tried and they can't, and they are actually bringing their food scraps to local single family dwelling homes. That's not right. That's not what we're paying for. It would be up to the building manager and the owner to provide that service, uh, and and if enough tenants request it, and the manager or owner is willing. South San Francisco Scavenger is more than willing. Uh, we've done a lot of outreach with the, based on the various legislation to get all of the apartments and condominiums recycling. There are some that have organics, and it is limited compared to the recycling. The recycling is very challenged in a mixed unit, and I know you're aware of that. There's a lot of contamination. There's a lot of issues. We can't force people but we can encourage and we can uh, do our part in, in the outreach. And we've done a lot of that over the years and, and working together to make sure that we're following the state legislation that requires it. But it does take the owner for food scraps. That's not part of the legislation. So would we need a local ordinance to say all of our residential properties should have access we would have to do, if that were the case, to make it uh, to ensure that every apartment building or condominium, the state only requires yard trimmings for five units and more. So the reason I bring this up, if we had a climate action plan that had specific targets, one of the easiest ways of reducing the impact of methane is to have food scrap programs and then get them to the anaerobic digester and turn them into fuel. It's one of the easiest things that we can do. We simply have to have the will to do it. And since it's been up on next door, and since there are residents who want the service, I'd like us to be more aggressive in getting those services to them. And I'm we happy. all know that mm -hmm. property managers are going to be recalcitrant. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to work with them and also the South San Francisco scavenger. We're happy to work with anyone to get those services. We want them to have those services. Okay, great. Next question. How many of the 32-gallon customers are going to go to a 20-gallon customer with a new rate? It's a $5, it's, well, 5%, $2 increase. I'm not sure what that expectation is or, you know, I, I don't have an estimation. There may be some that will migrate smaller and they would have to, you know, likely increase their recycling and, and, and organic collection as well. Darn. What's that? I'm, oh, sorry. I'm being facetious. I said darn. Oh, <laughs> um, but hopefully, you know, that that is our goal. And it's a goal of the South San Francisco scavenger to divert as much waste as a landfill and you know. so what would have been nice in the staff report if it said one way that the public can reduce the cost of their garbage bills is by recycling more and doing compost more. And our staff report didn't talk about that. It didn't say this is how you get out of this, this increase, unless you're already at the 20-gallon rate because we don't do a mini can. When I, I mentioned earlier how uh, we had switched from the 96 gallon was a standard. And so the majority, I mean, I don't know, it's, you know, 80 percent or whatever are at that 32 gallon. That's when we had the hugest migration and made a big difference in diverting waste from landfill. My last question is, why isn't Brisbane's rate included on the rate comparisons when Brisbane and South City and and we have exact, I assume, the exact same program? We do have the exact program, and they, uh, they're they in the same rate-setting type of, of period, and I'm not sure if that was the reason they're, they're not included. Um, there are 32 cities included. Uh, South San Francisco or South San Francisco's included, uh, and, and their rates actually will be adjusted by July 1 as well. And uh, I'm not sure the exact reason why Brisbane isn't included, or if they need to be included, that's something that could be looked at. So the South San Francisco rate, which is currently $31 and change, would be more in line with what will be at $34? And I, I, my computer, I have to look I don't know in. exactly uh, what that rate will be for South San Francisco. It will likely be up, you know, w within a similar range, I would imagine. They have some different variables and franchise fees and, and that, but their rate will be adjusted 
July 1, just like ours. Okay, good. It would be good for future reports like this to talk about when these various cities are doing their rate adjustments. Otherwise, it's really hard for me to pick out who, why is Palo Alto at 60 plus dollars? I'm going to call people in Palo Alto to find out why they're so high on that one. But it was hard for me to compare apples and apples on that. Other questions? Yes, Ms. Vice Mayor Lee. Um, thank you for your report. Can you also address Councilwoman's uh, um, supposition um, why we're not doing a cost-based analysis versus this type of uh, contract? That was a decision that was made years ago and implemented. It was adopted by the City Council at that time in 2004. The new market basket survey approach, as it's called, was implemented in 2005. It was done because my understanding is that it's very expensive on the part of the city, on the part of the scavenger company, um, involving attorneys on both sides. It's a lengthy process and it was decided to make the process more simple and to keep the rates down. And in comparison to the cost plus, the rates have increased less than they did under that approach. Thank, thank you. Um, and also, I just wonder, um, was that a shout out to Mr. Sandrini in Wyoming? <laughs> I hey, just, Lou? well, it was a question. <laughs> um, and I just, I just want to make one comment. I think that our rates could go down too if we had more of a commercial base to offset a lot of our costs, because that's a lot of cities have that opportunity and we don't. Um, Interesting thought. Can actually, okay. the wait a minute, Mr. Schneider, if you okay. would, please. Um, that's an interesting thought, and I see the scavengers' representatives in the audience shaking their heads to a yes. So should we? In it, it actually even says that right in the contract. So Very good. Good point. Thank you. Now, Ms. Schneider. I, I, then I'm going to be corrected. The trend nationally has been to stop commercial from subsidizing residential. We still have it in our contract that commercial is subsidizing residential rates no, no no there's just a comment that the the reason the city's rates are the way they are is that the city does not have a substantial commercial base i guess to subsidize so I, i'm not sure you can conclude that that means again the the trend has been to remove those because the message to residents and businesses are you will pay for garbage you will be rewarded for recycling when you bunt when you have one subsidizing the other the message to residents isn't as clear so to get the public to participate the those costs were separated it would be really unusual to me to find that we're going to start having commercial subsidized now if you're talking about volume that it gets cheaper to run a, a full truck than to run a half full truck that's a different argument if that's what you mean by having more commercial, having fuller trucks going back to the landfill. I'm not advocating anything. All I'm saying is that they think the status quo is that there's low commercial rates, so there's really no prospect of, of subsidization. So it's really not a... I just, I don't so, think not to correct Mr. Lee, but yeah, it's a, it's a different mechanism. If it happens, right. Mr. Holliber? I have a question. If our rates are based off of the survey results, then how would that change if our commercial residential balance changes? Uh, might not. I think you'd have to, might only occur if you renegotiated the agreement. I think it was just a statement of the facts at the time that the agreement was put into place. Okay. Um, yeah, I think maybe that's something, I mean, it seems like now we, it can't be renegotiated for seven more years. Six more. I, I mean, again, I, I think uh, uh, Council Member Lee stated it correctly. I mean, there, there was a uh, More of a long-term We, trend. for years, went through very difficult, very expensive, lots of consultants, and this is a an agreed-upon method. It's not perfect, and certainly, you know, there are some in the community who who feel very strongly that we should go through such a, a thing. But the decision was made not to, that, you know, we, we, and so we agreed on a, you know, this process of CPI, CPI, and then do a survey. Okay. So that yeah. that is it. I think we have six years to go, and if, you know, we can certainly monitor it and see if there's at some point we want to make a change. But. No, I agree. And I think we have heard that going through that whole process of 
um, cost base or if we were to do a RFP or something like that is very costly and in the end probably does not um, justify whatever marginal difference there would be in the rates. Um, I'd like to just request our friends from the scavengers next time, uh, and I assume this was in the contract, but maybe next time we do the survey, could we knock Piedmont out? They seem to be uh, <laughs> bringing up the, the, the averages uh, quite a bit. We, we Actually, there's an exhibit that lists the cities that are in the plan. So I, 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 I understand. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But well, if Point they can, noted. Okay. We they could throw us a bone maybe next time. We, we, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Ryder, my compliments as well. You've done a fabulous job, and I know every other city would love to have your services um, as far as encouraging our community to recycle. Um, and um, Ms. Schneider, if you have some sort of an ordinance you would like to propose, because that would be done at our level, um, and or sample one that we could give staff, um, we could add that, address that at a next goal setting session or something like that. But, um, well, it takes time. If you wish to do that, right now all we can do is do what we are, the community outreach that Ms. Ryder is so good at doing. Um, we appreciate that. Um, so, with that said, do we have a motion? We have a motion from Vice Mayor Lee, second by Ms. Oliva. Your votes, please. Item number 10 on the garbage rates passed unanimously. Thank you for your report, Ms. Ryder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tilly. The exciting stuff. Item 11, first budget review of a two-year operating and capital budget for the fiscal year 2018-2019 and 2019 20, uh, yeah, two-year, 20. I'm here. I'll pass. Thank you. Hello, Ms. Hildebrandt. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, glad to be uh, presenting to you this evening on our two-year um, this is a preliminary review of where we're at on the two-year budget. We'll be bringing a final budget book to you at our next council meeting. Um, but just wanted to give you a high level of what we've been working with as we get started. So um, we'll give you a little bit of an overview. Our focus tonight is on the general fund operating budget. We can um, talk a little bit about the other funds. Um, there are a few funds that are subsidized by the general fund, so those impact the general fund operating budget. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about the five-year capital plan and some changes in how that's presented. So, so we wanna start a little bit with some background definitions and some guiding principles. So the operating budget is basically your budget to do the day-to-day -day programs and activities that will continue on. So absent us reducing programs, um, reducing services, um, but they're not these one-time projects that typically have been categorized as capital projects but in reality, capital has a specific accounting definition, so we redefine them as special projects if they're not, from an accounting perspective, capital. So um, our capital and special projects budget is, are those one-time projects that we expect to conclude. Um, there may be capital items that keep happening over and over again, and that would be things like street projects that you do one street project, and a couple years later you do another street's project. Um, but there are other projects, for example, our finance system replacement that should be completed and then just be a maintenance item in our operating budget. Um, our goal is to present to you a balanced budget um, from the operations. So in a balanced budget, the operating revenues either meet or exceed the operating expenses. Um, an operating deficit is when that does not happen, so your operating expenses are greater than your operating revenues. Um, in the past three years that I've looked at, we typically budget an operating deficit. Um, but because we've not filled positions, we've ended up at the end of the year with a surplus of funds. Over the last year, we've really focused on filling positions and executing projects. And so I don't think we can rely on that savings and we really need to bring our budget structurally into balance. And we spent a lot of time on that and we'll talk more about that. Um, again, we're going to focus on the general fund. 
but we do have enterprise funds, we have special revenue funds, we have some internal service funds. We could talk a little bit more about each of those and again, how those impact the general fund. So for, for our process, um, we're in the second year of our financial system, our first year using the budget module of that system. Um, and so, like I did last year, we did a little bit of a hands-on process and worked really collaboratively, collaboratively with all of our department teams. Um, it wasn't even necessarily with the department heads. Many managers came and, and met with me to explain to me the programs they're working on. We looked at what they were actually spending funds on. So if there was a, a large budget that was unexpended, then we considered, you know, did they really need a budget of that size? So we could really work to trim those expenses there may be situations where something was budgeted more than once, just in two different categories, that type of thing. We, we really took advantage of the financial system, which all the departments have access to. They can look at their own reports at any moment they want. We don't, they don't have to wait for finance to send them a monthly report. They can drill down a cost all the way to the point of seeing the invoice that was put into their, into their account. Um, so um, we, lo we looked at that, you know, where they're really at, what do they, what do they really need? maybe what projects they just haven't quite done this year that they're rolling forward. What do they need to do that's still really in operations versus a special project? Um, and probably 10 or 15 of those meetings, you know, just the variety of divisions and departments that we work with. Um, then um, in the finance team, we look at our other funds. So for example, there's debt service the general fund needs to pay and transfer to a debt service fund. There are internal service funds, such as our general liability fund, our garage fund, our vehicle replacement fund. We distribute costs amongst all of the departments for those items and identify those transfers. Um, and again, some of that relieves pressure from the general fund um, so that the fund that is benefiting from the cost is paying the cost. And where we can find restricted funds to pay for costs, we will use them to make the general fund available for the things that can't be used on other items or tasks. So um, from an overview of the general fund, our, our top revenue source is property tax. 39% of our revenue is in property tax. 28% is in transient occupancy tax. We've talked a little bit about that tonight. Um, sales and use tax, about $3 million, 11%. And followed by a number of smaller um, revenue items. The other category is quite a few small things. Use of money and property is rents and insurance. Um, intergovernmental, intergovernmental revenue, such as grants or uh, transfers we receive from the state. Um, transfers, so some funds transfer into the general fund to pay costs of administration. For example, human resources and finance services that are provided citywide. And um, business license tax is actually such a small um, percentage that it's categorized, categorized as other. On the expense side, um, our largest expense is public safety costs. And what we've included here is both the contract costs for our police and fire services, as well as the ongoing costs that the city has to pay for post-employment benefits for both active members, so maybe employees that transferred to our contract agencies, or for employees that retired from the city while the city was um, still providing those services directly. So that's a pretty significant component of our cost structure. Um, about 24% of our cost is in salaries and benefits for non-public safety. 15% um, in services and supplies, and the general fund subsidizes other funds, that's operating transfers to the tune of about $2 million. So looking at the last few years, we... Um, um, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Uh, the other, uh, um, the op uh, operating transfers, does also include the rainy day fund? Um, the rainy day fund is, is actually a part of the general fund fund balance or reserves, so it is not accounted for at all in the operating budget. It is just set aside. And so the operating transfers currently is recreation, storm drain, and a debt service fund. So looking back over the last few years, again, we've, we've started with an operating deficit in each of the last three years of about $2 million. Um, for this year, we are right now at this moment looking at still a $1.6 million deficit that we're working to close. And we'll, as we go forward, we'll look at the options that staff is looking at to help to close that. Um, and in 2020, we're looking at an ongoing deficit as well. For now, we're focused on 2019 
and then we'll be looking at some revenue options um, that we can maybe implement in 2019 for 2020. So the primary causes of the increases in our budget um, is the increase in retirement costs. You, you all have heard a lot about that, and I do still owe you a PERS presentation. Um, so it, um, part of retirement costs is what's called UAL, or Unfunded Actuarial Liability. So each year PERS calculates based on in all the active employees' current salary, what they expect their salary might be when they retire, how long they expect them to live, a number of factors, and identifies this UAL cost. This is separate from what they call the normal cost, which is about 14% um, of employee salaries, of which employees pay 5%, plus another 8% um, that employees pay. So this, this UAL is a fixed dollar figure that the city pays to CalPERS on an annual basis. The bulk of it for the general fund is, again, in public safety, about $725,000. The miscellaneous component, $250,000, that's the general fund portion, and the rest of it is distributed through other funds that have employees. So the total cost of UAL for all funds is about $4.4 million this year. And we've also had an increase in our public safety cost this year. So for police services, the increase was about $150,000. Um, and for fire service, the increase was about $520,000. Um, for fire, they absolutely were significantly impacted by UAL cost increases, um, and that same occurred with the city's fire UAL for employees that are no longer with the city. Do you, do you have a percentage? For, for uh, police, the percentage is 3%. For fire, it is 7%. So um, again, our first review where we met with all the departments and teams and asked them, you know, in an ideal world, what do you need? We had, about a, we had a deficit of about $3 million. So we've, we've really carved that down. We really worked, you know, dug in and said, well, maybe, you're co you, maybe you got this budgeted twice. Where, what's going on here? Do you need to do that? Can you do a little bit less? And we've gotten that down, like I said, to about $1.6 million. So we're going to be working over the next few days on the, the remaining $2 million or so dollars. And we just wanted to share with you some of the options we're looking at. So we're going to be looking at transferring the costs of staff that are associated with capital projects. So that's primarily your engineering staff, um, so that they are charged to the capital projects versus just to the general fund. Um, and again, in the general fund, it's only the staff performing projects associated with the general fund, such as streets projects, parks projects, facilities projects. Um, if they're, they're performing services related to sewer or, or water, those are charged to those funds. Um, we're looking at unfunding some vacant positions. That does not include code enforcement. The proposal that we are giving you includes a full-time code enforcement officer. Um, and, and we're not looking at taking that out in this process. Um, we're going to continue to look at some of the savings that are possible in departments with vacant positions. So it may be that we've, again, we've gotten some, some positions contract are put in salary as well as we're contracting and maybe we've got some double opportunities for savings there. Um, we're, we, um, as, a, as a resort, um, not an ideal resort because it's effectively a transfer from reserves, we're looking at using our OPEB trust funds. So we have OPEB trust funds of about $6.5 million that we've set aside to pay post-employment medical benefits. Um, those are general funds that have been set, set aside this is the purpose of those funds. And so if needed to balance our budget, we can draw on those funds and, um, and pay those benefits. And uh, a next area is to reduce our operating transfers to a couple of funds. One is the storm drain fund. That fund currently has some fund balance available. So that would get us through this year from the operating side. We'll still have to make some capital transfers. And the other is um, recreation programs. So we're looking at, while we're, while we're pending a master fee study, we'll be looking at doing a, a more uh, abbreviated recreation fee increase to increase some revenues in that area. We'll also be looking at more of a comprehensive review of recreation programs to see if maybe there are some that are, that are um, maybe more costly than, than are reasonable for the city to subsidize and consider whether we want to continue them. So again, the next steps in the general fund is we're going to be putting these proposed options in place. 
We'll report back to you on June 12th with um, a budget book and a balanced budget. We'll be looking at an interim fee schedule update, again, focused on recreation. Um, with a master fee study, we'll be talking about that later as well, with the master fee study update, update RFP to go out soon after. And then throughout the next fiscal year, we'll be working on a number of activities to continue to, re to address the structural imbalance that we're facing. So are there any questions I can answer on the operating budget or I can move on to the capital budget? Yes. Yes. Um, more to just a comment, can you next um, add uh, in consideration of the projection cost that we did now from the specific plan for the uh, TOD one and two in the five in the five year plan, so we get an idea of you know what we can expect in revenue. So as it stands today, those um, projects pay a direct cost recovery. So we directly. For example, if we contract services, we directly just charge in the services we've contracted. If an employee works on, the pro on a project, we directly recover those employee costs. We will significantly improve that recovery with a master fee study, um, and that is, that is planned for, for next year. But um, right now, it's just a cost recovery model. Well, actually, what I meant was um, there's some expected uh, revenues from TOD, uh, TOT and other, uh, yeah. Uh, I know the projects won't come online for at least a couple of years, but... You're referring to the building permit revenue, is, is that right? No, I'm talking about expected sales, sales tax, tax oh. revenues, so we'll property be... tax revenues, um, and the expenses that goes with that, too. We want both sides. Um, but I know you can't really project that right now, but, you know, if we can get a five-year plan or ten-year plan so we can kind of figure out where we can, you know, what are we looking at in terms of... Um, uh, long-term planning for the city. Yeah, so you'll see at the end of this presentation that is our, one of our next steps besides the master fee study is a 10-year is a financial plan. It's going to base off of this fiscal year's budget, this 2019 budget when we're done because we have the most confidence in the numbers. And uh, so that's the entry point to getting that done. Our consultant expects to move pretty quickly once they have this data that we're, that we're wrapping up here. And they can take in the economic studies that were done for the, the two TODs. And, and we could do kind of two scenarios or three scenarios in terms of timing when they come live. So that, that can be included and has been addressed in our contract with that consultant. And I would hope we've been notified about some transportation money that we, CCAG, will be issuing very quickly. I hope we will be in line for some of that. Um, those applications. Ms. Schneider? A couple of questions. Yes. The increases in fire, have we planned a fire subcommittee? Are they coming back to us for any formal authorization for that? We haven't had a fire subcommittee meeting in over a year. We can certainly schedule one. I'm, I'm sure the chief would be happy to present. Um, the, the interpretation or the reading of the contract was just to present through city manager as part of budget process, and we had a transition at the time. So certainly if that's the desire, we can, we can get that scheduled right away. Okay. It just, I think the previous two years we've at least had a meeting with the fire subcommittee to talk about why the increases are and, and how they are in terms of what we promise the public by going into Central County Fire. Yeah, and I'm sure they'll be happy to have that. I, I, I apologize. It was probably my lapse as we, um, as we had some transition here. And um, the two position or the unfunded vacant positions, which positions are those? Uh, the current unfunded uh, vacant positions is a position in human resources and a deputy director of public works position. And has there been any savings or has it cost more by reducing the use of consultants? Um, in the, um, the public works department, I think they've just really reorganized and been able to operate pretty efficiently. Uh, Key can speak to that a little bit. And from my perspective, in terms of us changing purchasing process, they've done a fantastic job. So um, I'm going to give him props for that. Um, for, for HR, we, we did some rearrangement of assignments. Um, so for example, recreation was moved out of that area. And so that, that left, that freed up some staff. Where is Rick, Rick? With finance. Oh, okay. So it already happened. They're bringing the fund to finance. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Holliber. 
Um, very minor in terms of the overall scope here, but is there some type of uh, so something currently in the budget for the various committees and commissions? I know in past years they've had some very minor, you know, discretionary budget of a few thousand dollars that they could spend on special projects. And I, I believe one of our goals was to empower the commissions and committees, and I think it's hard to do that without having some type of a minimal budget. So as a part of the goal setting process, uh, we are instructed to bring forth those plans. We, we probably through some, some funds identified in the city manager's office that can then be transferred as needed, will identify the funding needed. So as they bring forward their work plans, their new work plans. So through the summer staff, um, probably the department heads will be meeting with those respective committees, identifying what those specific work plans are. And I, I took a look at one and I agree it didn't have some some tangible outcomes. So that was our that was our commitment to you as council. And then with that we'll be identifying the budget to get it done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think also um, just not just the budget issue, but to be sure they've got the staff. So when something comes up that's not in work plan, you know, we're saying, well we've got a work plan to work with. So having a work plan they can you know, now a grant comes up, we can say, okay, well, that's in the work plan, get on the grant, that type of thing. Thank you. Please continue. Um, anything else? Okay. Moving on to the capital budget, um, Deputy City Manager Lim will make most of this presentation, but I will start with um, just some background on what's different so looking at what you've done for the past years in the capital budget, there was a five-year plan, but it didn't really articulate what you had money for. So um, when I looked at it today, the budget that was adopted in 2016, you had about a $90 million capital budget adopted, um, but you didn't have that much money to implement that budget. So, <laughs> so we looked, we, we started from 2018. We did what I call a zero-base budget. What that means is I don't assume that because you because it was approved in 2014 or 15 or 16 or 17, we're not assuming that that money is still sitting out there. It's very difficult from a financial planning perspective to do that, and it's it's you know you're working from memory. So if you um, were able to look at the larger capital document we presented to you, we listed what was there in 18, but we're also making some recommendations around deferring projects and what's really funded and not funded. Um, in an ideal world, there is some surplus at the end of the year, and, and those can be allocated either to, for example, to reduce our liabilities, our pension liabilities that we talked about, or to build capital. Some of the reason we have that level of funding is just we have not executed. So as we start executing, those funds will go away. That is the right thing to do. We're not a, we're not a bank for the city, for the residents' funds. We need to execute and get projects done but those funds won't be sitting there um, for there to be such a large project base. So we're gonna, we looked at the general fund reserves, the fund balance where it is now. We use the 25% number of, um, we don't have a formal reserve policy, we'll be working on that, but we use 25% of those funds to determine what's left over. Um, I disagree, I signed a formal reserve policy. Okay. There is one on the books. I will see if I can find it then. I'm, I'm sure you'll find it. Okay. <laughs> I'm challenged. Um, so um, again, we've, we've built you a capital budget that indicates where funding is available. Um, and then our basis for our recommendations starts with your goals, your strategic goals identified on May 5th. We make sure those projects are previously funded. We wanted to complete initiatives that have already been started. Um, we wanted to consider the health and safety of the city and its contingent constituents. We wanted to consider federal and state mandates and long-term sustainability of the city. So when we're looking at our recommendation, and, and we welcome your thoughts or comments as we go through it, those are the, um, those are the key areas that we're looking at. So um, starting with the kind of um, special project side, um, and I think one more item to add is this is something we will also continue to refine over the next two weeks. We may bring back some different recommendations as of uh, as we've looked at, at staffing and alignment. So we will, we will be revisiting this again. So we're, we're completing a document management program, including um, records retention software that will help make it easier to find some of these things like you just mentioned. Um, in finance and information technology, we'll be looking at a master fee study 
That study is intended to include development impact fees, cost allocation plan, which is how other non-general fund departments pay for general fund service, again, such as finance, human resources, administration, and a revenue study, which would be somebody coming to you and saying, here's all your options to bring in more money to the city. Um, all kinds of levels of how easy or hard they are to do, but that's, that's what we're looking at. Um, we are completing our finance, working to complete our finance system upgrade. Um, that may have a, another year after this one. And then ongoing information technology upgrades, including a phone system replacement and extension of the Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi project. In community development, from your council goals, we are working on a business improvement district. Um, we're also looking at our housing element implementation. You recently approved contract for the multi multimodal comp stationary access plan. Most of that will be encumbered this year, meaning the funds are held, but we um, are preserving some funds into next year. Um, we are completing our active transportation, uh, and this is an area that we're looking at. We may be, we may be solid there. Uh, looking at updating the zoning code, which follows the general plan. That may be deferred as the general plan is delayed. And we also have a commitment to the affordable housing project of $2.8 million, and that will have to be held from the general fund and committed. So there's a few projects in community development that we're recommending. Excuse me, that's a typo. My colleagues gave away $2.88 million. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out, Mr. Holliber. <laughs> yes, Ms. Schneider. Yes, please. Um, the housing element implementation, what is that? I know uh, the housing element, but what are we implementing for 100000 150,000. That is something we'll be looking at a little, and we, we, I mentioned that earlier, we'll be looking at some of these a little more deeply. We do now have a project manager. She's for housing and economic development. She's been on the ground for about six weeks or so, and it may be something that can be handled in-house, in which case those funds aren't needed. So as we work through budget um, earlier this year, the director identified funding was needed, but we may find that we're able to do that in-house. Um, but I believe it was to get some consulting work to make sure we're meeting the guidelines of our housing element of our general plan. Tom, do you have any better answers? I think that's good for it, okay. it may also include a, uh, an affordable housing fee. You mean an in lieu fee? An in, well, an in lieu fee or a <clears throat> or a commercial trigger, a commercial. Uh, okay, fee. so the creation of the documents and the ordinance to be able to do right. that. Okay. Or development of the program, right? Plus, we have we have reporting obligations on the house. I'm sorry. Elements. Commercial linkage. We linkage fee, right? Okay. Commercial, commercial linkage. Commercial linkage. Fee. Yeah, and we also have reporting obligations on the housing element now to the state. So, I just thought maybe we were building housing. So when I hear implementation, now. <laughs> Please continue. So on that note of our project manager for economic development and housing, we've um, suggested that we defer the, some of these economic development projects we've had in place. Um, Elisa will be developing a plan, and then we can revisit those at this time. So that's your downtown improvements, economic development implementation, which again may be able to be brought into staff and, and operating costs, and SFO projects. And some of these weren't very clearly defined for us, and that was part of the reason we felt better to get it assigned, get it staffed, and then bring something more, um, more concrete back to you. Uh, what is not clearly defined to me is this SFO project. What is that? Honestly, it was in your capital plan for 2018, and we have not identified what that really meant. I think it said SFO tourism or tourism SFO. I, okay, might I know. Believe, there used to be money to put signage up in uh -huh. there. I, I believe the uh, money was set aside for us to work with the tourism committee when we had one and to work with all the airport adjacent hotels on advertising banners and hotel signs uh, and what have you. Well, we have banners already. And um, what about the um, construction that's going on within the city of Millbrae on the SF property? Do we need some permits from them and should we be getting some funding are you uh, referring to site seven uh, yes. construction that is correct we are going to be working with the airport on the permit uh, issue about installing a tall fence and that hasn't happened yet 
and I will follow up with the airport. I, I believe it's more than the fence. Correct. I think you should be looking at some hauling fees and some other things too, which would be greatly appreciated. Uh, we definitely will follow up on that. Thank you. Ms. Schneider. So it's never been quite clear to me the two parks, Marina Vistas Park and Bayside Manors Park, as well as Bayfront Park, but those two parks in the neighborhoods, SFO maintains them or we maintain them and SFO owns them. Any, either way you look at it, the residents in those areas complain about the quality of what those parks look like. But I've been waiting for the park's master plan. I understand that. Uh, I can answer to that. Marina Vista and Bayside Manor Parks are actually leased uh, by City of Millbury to uh, San Francisco, City and County of San Francisco uh, with a $1 lease a year. Bayfront Park is no longer under our maintenance and we are still maintaining uh, Bayfront Parks and Bayside Manor Parks and both uh, we are aware that it needs attention and it also needs some money so that's why we are here tonight talking about capital program and how we're going to prioritize limited resources that we have. You can't renegotiate that $1 fee? I think okay. they'll probably uh, waive that for us. Thank you. So I, I hope um, kind of the message regarding some of these things that are unclear is that's, that's why we're doing what we're doing. We're revisiting from zero and saying, you know, what are we really accomplishing here? And we think we, we've identified even up to today that we still have some work to do there. But we want to make the best use of the funds we have available. Um, so now that Keith sat down, he'll come back up and finish up talking about public works. <laughs> I know we have been in meetings since uh, 6 o'clock tonight, so I will make this uh, as painless as possible and as quick as I can so make why, it. Why don't you introduce yourself? I am Killim, Deputy uh, City Manager, Public Works Director. Good evening, Mayor Papman, Vice Mayor Lee, and members of the City Council. And Deanna, before you, did you do a well, proper Then I should introduce uh, the other Deputy Director, Deanna Hilbrandt. So tonight I will be talking about uh, Public Works uh, Capital uh, and Special uh, Project. So first, uh, a couple projects that we had on the capital plan last, uh, last fiscal year, which is still in the current fiscal year, that we are going to uh, be referring. And the first one uh, uh, would be the uh, City Hall uh, message board sign. And we all agree at the uh, May 5th uh, goal setting council retreat that we will uh, uh, lower the priority on this project. And also in order to try to come up with the $3 million savings in general fund, it, we are going to slow down on the ADA transition plan, and that is not going to get us into any type of legal uh, problem because we already have an ADA transition plan. We know what we need to do. We just haven't identified sufficient funding to address those. And I'm going to just go to uh, public works uh, uh, departments by department. First, we are going to be looking at uh, Facilities and facility means our city owns our buildings. First off, we have a city hall campus here, including fire department and police and library that we need to put some money into maintaining it. For example, we have a couple landscaping, small landscaping project that we will uh, need to uh, complete. First would be the ADA project that we completed on the exterior sites of city hall, and we have some landscaping that will be following up uh, this summer. And uh, one of the uh, projects that we are, we are proposing for fiscal year 2019 is a facility master plan. And that is one project that if we cannot afford to do it in 2019, we can defer it to 2020 or later. And what I mean by uh, facility master plan, which is uh, a master plan to look at our city-owned facilities and look at what is the life cycle, cycle of these buildings and what kind of maintenance that efforts that we have to put into uh, this building in order to prolong uh, its useful life. And also uh, the type of maintenance, our ongoing maintenance that we need. And the next project is uh, the fire station project, and that is uh, going to be a generator at fire station number 38 on uh, Crestview that we have to replace because we are no longer meeting Air District's uh, requirements on that. And we're also coming to an end of the useful life of the generator because of the emission from the generator. 
and we're also looking at uh, re-roofing the... Uh, any any question, Mayor Pappen? Yeah. <laughs> Do you want um, to... Well, part of the fire assessment was an assurance that we would keep that station open. All right. So, um, how, what are we... What's the bottom line there? Uh, the bottom line is that we have uh, some time to replace the generator so that we will continue to keep the station uh, operational. And we are addressing that. We are currently in a design stage to replace the existing generator. And the implementation will be sometime in 2019. Okay. Fire stations have to have emergency generator and the emergency generator is no longer in compliance with air, air emission standards. So they have to replace it. Don't you have any connections with the, just kidding. Go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Um, also, uh, we are looking at uh, some re-roofing at some of the city buildings. Uh, uh, for example, our police uh, building. It's just about time that we need to look at uh, um, um, replacing or repair the roofs. Um, key. Yes. Um, Vice Mayor Lee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> uh, so when we had. Um, so we're going to have to plan to add a, a, a ladder unit to uh, one of the stations because if we're going to build that 11-story building, we're going to have to store that truck somewhere close by, right? Is there What's the plans for that truck? I do not have an answer right now, but I definitely can work with the uh, city manager and get an answer back to you. I think uh, also because now that we are part of Central County, we have uh, another close by station and, and Rollins Road in Burlingame that can add respond to, uh, to the incident at the uh, TOD sites. Yeah, that's pretty far away. That is uh, correct, too. Ms. Ms. Schneider. The latter truck's already been purchased and is at Station 34 on California. Oh. Okay. But it is something, and we're going to have to keep, keep pushing to keep 38, because they still would like to close 38 and create a new station in Hillsboro. Well, I mean, okay, let's, yeah, okay. On, right here. Back on focus, let's go. All right, so moving on, now we are done with facility, we're going into parks. And one of the big uh, items I know that I've been standing at this podium addressing the council, uh, which is the El Camino Real uh, median landscaping. Unfortunately, with the drought, the recent drought and whatnot, many of the trees out there are actually diseased and dying. So we are looking at a, a total wholesale replacement. So we are looking at something similar to City Hall uh, uh, landscaping, uh, zero scape water-wise type of landscaping. And we are going to be developing some conceptual plan and bring them to Parks and Rec and subsequently City Council for uh, review and comments on that. So that's one line item. Mr. Lim, I'm deeply concerned about the public safety aspect oh. of diseased trees on El Camino Real. Um, I'm not sure sure <clears throat> that should be delayed, um, just even in removal. I don't know that you have to go through the full um, recycling of the whole thing, but please be quite aware that that's the widest part of El Camino and just as a, as a public safety measure, I'm not sure that we should be delaying that much further but it's yeah you have an arborist in your staff and i hope that you will use him in determining i heard you loud and clear and we definitely are doing something we had removed uh, a, a few dozen redwood trees out, out on long el camino we had done a, a, a few dozen uh, what they call deep root fertilizing and we are hoping to see some turnaround, but I am somewhat not too positive about that. So we will get back to you. Um, while you guys are at it, can you guys, um, I noticed that the mediums are getting overgrown with weeds. Could you guys, you know, at least address that, please? Definitely, I think I have gotten a message from the city managers about something similar to that, and we'll be addressing that. Yes, Ms. Schneider. The, um, we currently have, is it four park staff that take care of the maintenance of all of these property areas? Are you asking to stay at the same number of staff or additional staff? 
we are asking to keep the same numbers of staff. We have a total of eight staff in parks divisions, including the superintendent operators, and not only median landscaping that we are maintaining, we have about 112 acres of park lands and also the school playing fields that we are maintaining. So there is a lot of uh, job for these uh, eight uh, guys in our little division there. So one of the most frequent complaints from the public is weeds. So how can we keep the public happy and keep the staffing the same and fix the 1.6 million budget deficit? Again, I am not a genius. I don't have answer right now. Hopefully I can come back to you and give you some satisfaction <laughs> answer on that. And the other things about weeding is that we are trying to uh, uh, stay with the integrated pest management policy that we have and try to minimize the use of pesticide. So that is somewhat challenging to us. So we need to balance the needs and the health and safety of our residents. We just gave the garbage company a big increase. Maybe they could give us a lot of free mulch. They're not here. But most city yeah. contracts would have a mulch contract. So we'll, we'll, we'll look into that. The weeding seems to be a, 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 theme, a theme tonight uh, with complaints. So I'll look into that. Goats. Goats are cheap. Actually, I saw them riding the bot train home one day along the SFPUC property. They have these uh, small goats, maybe a few dozens of them. They, they were we out might, there grazing. We might want to invest in some goats. You okay. can rent them. Oh, you can. Yeah, you rent them from a former garbage company. On, Moving along, we're getting close to 11. Let's go. <laughs> so the next item on my list is landscape improvements for 100,000, and that will be a re-landscape fire station uh, 38 on Crestview. The Millbury Museum, you'll notice that we are a little bare out there without any landscaping. And also, like I mentioned earlier, we have a little patch up front in front of the police bureau that we need to address. And that is that uh, 100,000. And then following by the next item, which is Park's master plan implementation, I just heard um, um, Councilwoman N. Schneider mention that she's still waiting for Park master plan. We are hoping to uh, wrap up the Park master plan by the end of June and then at least uh, conduct some sort of study session and get you familiarized with that. So. End of June is my goal. It could, we could potentially run into some minor delay. I don't know how to define that minor delay, but. We'll let you know. And uh, we are just putting a, a quarter million dollar placeholder on next year budget based on the outcome of the parks master plan, things that we have to implement. Again, like uh, Deanna had mentioned before, we're looking at federal state mandates and we're looking at health and safety and wellness of our residents. And those are our priority when we're addressing the uh, uh, shortcomings in our parks. And the next item is uh, Millbury Transit Center to spur trail connection, and that is actually going to be uh, about two thirds of that is funded to a uh, CCAC, uh, not CCAC, MTC TDA Article Three grant, uh, somewhere around four hundred fifty thousand, and it's going to be a two-year project. We are just uh, concluding our sequel process at this point, so we are going to go into final design shortly, with the implementation happening in perhaps in twenty twenty. And continuing on with parks, we have some incomplete project from last year because of either of our staff resources and, and accommodations of other reason. So we are not going to be purchasing additional Big Valley this upcoming year. And speaking of Big Valley, I was just stopped by a resident uh, during the council meeting break. She accidentally dropped her car key and a home key in the Big Valley up by the library. And this is not unusual at all. <laughs> when we first installed those Big Valleys at the li uh, at, in front of the library, we have a lot, a lot of customers actually returning books and audio tips into the Big Valley. So we have to put a sign out there. This is not a book return. <laughs> And again, <laughs> and again, ADA transition plan, like I mentioned earlier, that's something that uh, we don't have to do next year, but it's nice that we could continue to address the deficiency in our transition plan. And uh, spur trail wood railing is something that we didn't have to do last year, so we ended up might refer, uh, deferring them to a future date unless it is a critical item. And also, uh, we might slow down on our installation on tree grades in public sidewalk. And lastly, uh, 
we had thought about uh, replacing the playground equipment at Central Park, and now on second thought, we think we might just want to defer that pending the outcome of our recreation facility, sir. <laughs> now we're moving on to uh, topics that we all love, streets. So the same thing next year, we'd like to uh, at least request a funding of half a million dollars for sidewalk, continued sidewalk replacement. We have had several uh, uh, lawsuit complaints and also I have uh, set into a couple of depositions and we have paid out quite substantial amount of uh, claim amount because of trip and fall. So we need to address that very aggressively and proactively. And then we did a, uh, we did a, a street presentation perhaps about a year or so ago. We know uh, our PCI pavement condition index is among the lowest in the county, the third lowest, and at 54 points out of the 100. So in order to bring our PCIs up by about five points, we need to spend somewhere in the range of four and a half million or so in the next five years to do so. So in the, in the next upcoming uh, fiscal year, we are asking for a four million dollar budget for uh, uh, street repaving, of which about three million is going to be coming out from gas tax, measure A, and come from uh, SB1, and the hit to um, general fund will be about one million dollar. And then again, we can have another discussions about that. We can maybe perhaps trim that budget slightly to meet our budget goal to have a balanced budget. And next year, we're going to try to, uh, since we've been talking to you about doing preventative maintenance on our streets, such as slurry seal, cape seal, so we are going to do an experimental project next year, a large-scale slurry seal project to return to about a million dollars. So we are going to address streets in a fairly good condition by putting a seal coat on top of it by prolonging the useful life of our streets. So in the last uh, fiscal year uh, capital budget, we have a couple items on that that uh, we are going to be uh, deferring. The first one, which is the Millbury Avenue bike bridge pedestrian overcrossing, and Mayor Pappen had mentioned something about CCAT grant, and that is actually due tomorrow, and I have already had the uh, letter of interest to CCAT staff this afternoon. In that grant program, we are going to be seeking some funding to help uh, using a consultant from CCAT to help us complete our application for ATP Cycle 4, which is going to be due sometime at the end of uh, June, and we intend to put in a fairly large uh, funding request to the uh, state of California ATP cycle four. Good job. And then the next thing is the uh, next uh, item is Route 20A undergrounding, which is a PG&E set aside credit for Millbury. We have somewhere in the range of $3 million to do under, to form an undergrounding district. And due to limited resources that we have staffing wise and, and money wise, and we recommend that we defer that out by another couple of years and continue to collect the credit from PG&E. Uh, Ms. Schneider. Uh, I'm sorry, on the uh, Millbury Avenue bike bridge, have we formally sent a letter of request to the move, get us moving people that we'd like consideration of funding from that tax measure to come for that project or any other projects in Millbury? We've got a little bit more time for that. I know I I, I, be, I believe it's still just public comment stage, so anybody can make that request, not necessarily a city. So you you can request that online. Well, I've already done it as an individual, but or as a, C, a BPAC member. But what about formally as a city saying that this is a critical project for us to get a bike pedestrian overpass over 101? I don't see why not. I mean, one one thing that I would recommend, maybe at a future council meeting, that we'll come back with a resolution, and I think that would carry more weight on the city of uh, Millbury City Council, so we okay. can have a side discussions about that. If you know, I'm sorry, Keith. Along those lines, all of our transportation projects. And we should have a resolution and throw those into the traffic studies, everything. Just give me a bunch of resolutions. I'll sign them and send them up there. I mean, we should ask for the moon mm -hmm. and get okay. that funding in line. So, uh, I don't know that it'll go anywhere, but might as well ask. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. We'll say we asked. Go ahead. Shall I continue? Yes, please. Okay, moving on. Uh, we are now going to be talking about storm... Uh, Special project, capital project, and uh, should I change the slide too? 
this one, right? Yeah. Okay. So unfortunately, because of our aggressive inspection program of, of our storm drain system, we identified two structural uh, deficiency in our storm system, and they're going to need somewhere in the range of about $1.5 million to replace them. And we are actively putting together a, a bid document right now. We are hoping to get out to bid uh, sometime in towards the, more the end of the year with the project uh, being done sometime in 2019. And also, there is an internal transfer of $365,000 to the garage fund to make the uh, garage funds a whole. And then with that, uh, I would let uh, Ms. Hilbrink continue. So I just wanted to um, just provide a little bit more background and also considering the hour to see if you wanted to. So we're on to the enterprise funds now, again, primarily in public works. Um, in most cases, those enterprise funds are fund. I mean, except for the storm drain fund, they are self-funded. So when we bring you a financial plan, which usually comes along with a rate study, we we indicate capital needs in that financial plan. So it, again, except for the storm drain fund, the the recommendations are are funded for next year. Um, if you you know have had an opportunity to take a look at the the background documents, you'll see which projects are not funded. Um, the only item identified in the enterprise funds as unfunded is a tank replacement that we're just scheduled to do a debt financing. So until we do a debt financing, it's treated as unfunded. And then once we go through a debt financing process, we would, we would then consider it funded. So um, if you wanted Key to walk through those projects or consider in the hour, if you wanted to save that maybe for next time, I just wanted to, to pause for a moment. Um, yeah, we are reaching the 11 o'clock hour and... Yeah, it would seem like a good place to pause. Uh, I think it would be a good place to pause. Yeah. Is there anybody else? Okay. Um, and I did want to encourage, and if, and if we can put these in your box in the larger format, if that's helpful, you to please. take a look at what we've, so you can see what we funded, what we've unfunded. Yeah, um, that would be super helpful as Ms. Okay, Soliva then said. We, will, we will make that happen. It'll be in your box. And um, um, so that we can, again, we'll be back to you in a few weeks. Um, with a final recommendation, but it, it'd probably be helpful for you to have um, had some time to look at what's in there. Thanks. Okay, real fast. Oh uh, yeah, I just want to thank staff for the work, and also I also noticed that you also added uh, investment into you put some items here to invest into our economy. So rather than just the doom and gloom cuts, we're trying to also increase our revenues by investing in in, in those sources. Thank you, Mr. Holliber. Uh, this might be a very dumb question, but when we get the the formal budget for, for formal approval, we'll be getting the full spreadsheets and all of the tables and everything like that that we've You'll get the book the like you got in September, mm -hmm. so it won't be like every line item detail because right. I reconcile back to departments, but yeah, you'll see the, all the sources narrative and, uses and, and everything. Uh, all that, yeah. Okay, all right, great. Um, and, and the other item, so again, our, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but our next steps are sustainable financial plan. How do, how do we become sustainable into the future? So again, looking at the long-term projection, that item is already under contract and just pending, pending finalizing this budget so we can send them the reality for them to evaluate. Again, it's going to be focused on unfunded liabilities, including our pension and post-employment costs. And then um, shortly behind it, the master fee study. Um, Cost allocation plan, development impact fee study, and re revenue study. So uh, we don't stop here. We'll keep going. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> um, and staff, who everybody who participated in our goal setting session and at least set the number one goal, which was this fee setting, because there are projects in the mix that we don't want to lose out on um, receiving fees and stuff. I think that's going to be a top priority moving forward in the next week or so. So we need to discuss that. But I compliment you, Ms. Hildebrandt, and all the collaborations with the department heads and everybody working together. That really amazing. I applaud you all for working together to help us through this process. Thank you so much. Um, this was very helpful. Um, again, compliments to everyone. You did a great job here. And so the reserve policy was when I was mayor, I think 2008 or 2013. You can, we'll, we'll find that for you. I'll help you on that one. But you, you guys did a great job. Thank you so much. Um, any last minute questions? Super easy to follow. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Um, given the hour, 
Does anybody have any dire announcements they need to make? Yes, Ms. Schneider. Um, just to the public, the um, Millbury CERT program will be participating in the Green Dawn exercise on June 7th, it's a Thursday. Unlike most exercises where you need to be CERT trained, this one they're actually looking for other volunteers who can pretend to be the people that are gonna be rescued. The event will be taking place at Unipacera Park, which is right at the top of, of Helen Drive or if you come in from San Bruno. So if you're interested, if staff is interested, this is a great way to come out and work together collaboratively with CERT. I can say at the, the county level, we're talking about how to get more of the individual CERT programs working more together. So this is an exciting opportunity. You can still sign up. All right, I think I still need to take a vote here, though. I'm sorry, we have a closed session. No, we don't? <clears throat> We're not going to hold it. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. I thought we were going to close out. <clears throat> on the <laughs>